Yes, it's all live now. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, committee meeting of the General Purposes Committee. I'd like to begin by welcoming those members of the public and press who are watching the live stream of this meeting via the Council's website. Members, you are by now aware of the need to keep your video camera switched on for the duration of the meeting and to keep your microphone muted except for when I invite you to speak. Please click the raised hand function if you wish to ask a question or comment. There is always a risk that we may run into technical problems and I would ask for your patience if we do. Should this occur, I will declare an adjournment while the fault is addressed and the public broadcast will be paused. If it is not possible to address the fault, the meeting may have to be abandoned until such a time as it can be reconvened. Can I remind members and officers and any public speakers that all virtual meetings will be recorded and that these recordings will be published on the Council's website. I need to draw your attention to a software issue relating to the page numbering of the agenda, as the page numbers on the front of the agenda do not correspond with the actual page numbers in the agenda. I will, for clarity before each item, read out the actual page numbers to refer to. Having completed all that, I'd like to now call the names of the members that are present. Before I go on to that, I'm just going to mention the apologies for Councillor Steve Criswell, Councillor Lena Nieto will be substituting. Councillor Peter Hudson gives apologies and Councillor Anne Hay will be substituting. Councillor Peter McDonald has given his apologies, Councillor Sebastian Kindersley substituting and Councillor Anna Bailey Apologies, Councillor David Ambrose Bro Smith should be substituting. I'm now going to call on those members to, uh, to confirm their present. Councillor David Ambrose Smith. Present. Councillor Ian Bates. Present. Councillor Simon Bywater. Present. Councillor Lorna Dupre. Present. Councillor Derek Giles. Councillor Derek Giles, not present at, at the moment. Councillor Mark Goldsack. Present. Councillor Anne Hay. Present. Councillor Roger Hickford. Present. Councillor David Jenkins. Present. Councillor Noel Kavanagh. Present. Councillor Sebastian Kindersley. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Sebastian. <laughs> Councillor Eliza Machini. Present. Councillor Lucy Netzinger. Morning. Morning. Councillor Lena Nieto. Present. Councillor Tom Sanderson. Mm -hmm. Councillor Tom Sanderson. Please mark Councillor Tom Sanderson, not present at the moment. Councillor Josh Schumann. Morning. And obviously my attendance, myself, Councillor Steve Kelm. Does any member wish to declare any disclosable pecuniary interest or non-statutory disclosable interest on any of the agenda items for today? I'm not seeing any hands raised, so I will move on. Could I just remind members to mute your microphones, please? Lucy, could I ask you to mute? Thank you. All right, uh, agenda item number two, minutes of the meeting on 20 September, 22nd of September 2020 and the action log. Uh, we are being asked to approve the minutes of the meeting on the 22nd of September. As a correct record, can I ask any member who does not agree with the proposal to click the raise hand function on the right of your screen now. I see no objections to the proposal to approve the minutes as a correct record, so we will take that as carried. On that basis, the recommendation to approve the minutes is carried. I will sign a hard copy when we return to the office. An updated action log has been included in the published papers for this meeting. All the actions are marked as complete. 
If any members have questions on the action log, would they use the raised hand function on the right of the screen now to show this? No members have indicated that they wish to speak, so we'll take the action log as noted. Agenda item number three, petitions and public questions. I can confirm we have received no public questions or petitions, so we will move, move to the next item of business. Agenda item number four, the integrated finance monitoring report for the period ending 31st of August 2020. Can I ask uh, Tom Kelly from finance to introduce the report, please? Thank you, Chairman. I'll uh, introduce the main body of the report and then uh, other colleagues may want to comment also on section four, uh, which gives the wider COVID-19 overview. Uh, on page eight of the report, um, we see in contrast to the uncertainty and uh, the forward looking picture, which we'll see um, in the next report, in year, uh, so this year the council has a relatively balanced um, financial position um, we're projecting an overspend of 0.3 million uh, this reflects both uh, uh, the internal financial control from budget managers across the council and significant additional funding uh, received uh, predominantly from central government on page 10 we continue to provide the alternative um, forecast method although the committee will note that the difference between the two approaches is narrowing as we uh, progress through the year. Uh, this shows that in total we anticipate the financial consequences from the pandemic to amount to nearly 65 million and members will see there the funding spread across MHCLG, NHS uh, and the specific grants for uh, track, and uh, track and trace infection control and the uh, reimbursement of sales fees and charges. Um, the, uh, it's, it is worth, I, I think, emphasising that the, there remain significant risks to the forecast as we progress through the year, even, even in uh, and during the year. And on page seven that we see, um, even by July, there have been an increase in the number of children um, with child protection plans. And we've continued to see that increase continue through the rest of the year. And often that is a indicator or an early warning indicator of rising pressures uh, to come forward later on the, on the children in care placement budgets. Uh, most of the exceptions reported in this report are in two categories for revenue. They relate to our um, uh, projections around the pandemic and the impact that's had. Uh, particularly in this report on place and economy services where those adjustments have been updated. And then for um, the uh, for capital, uh, they're predominantly about um, timing. I should have said actually in introducing the table at page 10, one of the major changes since the last report is that there has been an extension of the infection control grant and that's what's uh, improving the position as that substituted for some of the funding that the council was otherwise um, anticipating it would need to fund to adult social care providers. And this report does not yet reflect the additional uh, funding announced last week. Uh, we know there's a further national allocation of a billion pounds across local government. We don't yet know what the Cambridgeshire element of that is but clearly that also helps us in the current year offset some of that um, pressure I was referring to. I think there's one recommendation on this report from the finance side today around um, capital funding and how that is deployed across um, school condition allocations. Uh, there's further details on that given in section 6.6 uh, and um, there are additional needs, which mean some of the grant is deployed towards that. Uh, but overall, there is a reduction in prudential borrowing uh, as a result of that additional grant. That's all I'll say on the on the finance side. Thank you very much for that, Tom. Uh, good introduction. Uh, just a couple of uh, comments from me before I hand it over more widely. Um, first of all, um, well, a question really, Tom, have we any indication uh, regarding that £1 billion extra settlement from government, what our slice is yet or when they're likely to issue the guidance on what portion Cambridgeshire will be receiving? Um, I don't think we do really. Chris may be able to uh, comment further. Um, all I can say is there's been two 
previous allocations of one billion, um, and they were they were distributed on different methodologies. I think the first time we got close to fifteen million, and the second time it was more like um, ten million. Um, and we believe there are separate allocations for areas in the in the very highest tier. Um, so I think there's reasonable uh, re cause to believe that we, it, you know, it, it, it should be a significant multi-million pound allocation again. But um, as far as I know, no kind of written details at all at this stage. Okay, thanks, thanks for that, Tom. Um, I just wanted to reflect that, um, you know, we. We said that the two figures would, would narrow throughout the year. They are starting to narrow. We're seeing significant swings in our finances based on when government releases money. So, for example, roughly £5 million for the uh, support that we need, we were indicated we needed to give to the social care sector for PPE, etc. Uh, and then the government funded that obligation. So that's been factored in now. Um, but because of the coronavirus and the impacts of it and the unpredictable nature uh, of what will happen, I do agree with uh, Tom Kelly's analysis that we are in quite uncertain territory. And whilst we'll do our best to predict the figures for future years and this year, um, we, we do, we can only put our very best estimates forward uh, based on the research that we use locally. Uh, but it is subject to major fluctuations. And we, are, of course, are looking forward to that major positive fluctuation of finding out exactly how much of that £1 billion pounds the, uh, the government is sending this way. Uh, I'd like to add a few comments on the uh, of my own on the report covering the coronavirus section, uh, item four of the port report. I think it's, it's important to recognise that the full report, uh, which is a very wide piece of report, and this is a there's a condensed part for us to, to look at. It's, it, it, it's a system-wide report. You know, it's not just the county council that can affect and, and assist uh, both uh, keeping down the coronavirus infection rate, but also assisting the, the recovery and the, the economic recovery whilst trying to maintain a, a really good education for our children and students. It is all our partners are in this, uh, all put, rowing in the same direction, whether it be the uh, mayor, the, the uh, NHS, the, the police, we all, uh, the districts in the city and the voluntary sector, and, and probably most important out of all of them is the individual. So the individual, despite all the lockdown tales that you hear, the tier one, two, and three, the biggest line of defense against coronavirus remains social distancing, washing your hands, for example, regularly. Those are the biggest defenses there are, wearing a mask in public places to protect others. So I want to re-emphasize that and, and let us not lose track of our own responsibilities in that arena and how much we can do to protect ourselves and other people. Um, on that system, wide piece of work. Um, we, we are working on the policy and demand implication for this council, as we should do. And we already have some recovery plans in place to tackle the emerging impact, emerging impact in many, many areas. Um, I'd like to indicate that we've got a, a general purposes committee workshop on the full report on the 13th of November. And that way we'll be able to discuss in much greater detail the themes pertinent to the general purposes uh, committee which will mainly be uh, economic recovery and the overall recovery strategy. Alongside that, the service committees will also be discussing the implications for their work during the next month. Uh, this council's recovery board has considered the report in detail to ensure that we're responding quickly. So we're not waiting for those November meetings. We already have a lot of actions underway to mitigate the impact as far we, as we can. And I'm also inviting group leaders along with myself uh, to have a chance to discuss the report this afternoon uh, in advance of committee discussions uh, and workshops. So that will really give us a good chance to get into the meat and, bo the meat and bones of that uh, report. Um, with nothing further from me at this stage, I'd like to invite the uh, committee to comment. I have a couple of hands already. So first of all, Councillor Net Singer and then Councillor Machini. Lucy. Thank you, Steve. Um, so so I, I totally agree with your comments about how very difficult it is to do financial forecasting or even looking back at this time when um, 
everything in our finances as well as everything in our lives is so unpredictable and changing on a daily basis. Um, so, so a huge thank you to Tom and the whole of the finance team for all the work that they've done in, in at least trying to map everything that is happening, which I think is, is incredibly important. Um, I think we need to recognize that um, there are some bits um, in this report which which are sort of looking back and making assumptions and one of those is uh, so so there are things like um in the adults um uh section that they talk about you talk about the five million pound pressure which is forecast and and how most of that is the impact of covid on in-year delivery of savings i absolutely recognize that covid has had a huge impact on um the delivery of savings it's really difficult to know what would have happened without covid and to be um we don't know how many of those savings would have been delivered if we hadn't had it, but but absolutely COVID has had a huge impact across all of our services um, and uh, making any kind of um, uh, predictions of what would have happened without it is, is kind of a mugs game, really. Um, we have to look at the situation that we're in now. Uh, and, um, and, 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 it is very, very important for that situation that we carry on mapping very carefully exactly where the money is going and where the pressures are, which are not necessarily in quite the places that they would have been in previous years. Uh, I think it's important to note that a huge amount of the pressure on the council um, is on is coming as a result of decreases in our normal income. I think it's important for the public out there to be aware of just what the um, what the impact on the council's finances has, has been of the reduction in our income, partly because um, later on in this meeting, we're going to come on to um, looking forward to next year's budget. And that's going to be absolutely critical to, to what we're able to do next year. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, thank you to Tom. And yes, it's a, a kind of a nightmare scenario in terms of financial predictions or looking back because everything changes every week. Um, I, I then wanted to move on to the um, to, to the section on um, recovery, uh, which I think is slightly misnamed. I think we might need to, to be looking at um, whether or not that's the right title for this this work at the moment it doesn't necessarily feel as if recovery is where we are um, I think maybe what we need to be talking about is resilience as we continue coping with the pandemic it doesn't feel to me at the moment as if we're recovering from the pandemic we have to work out how we're going to live with it um, for the next few months at least um, and and that's sort of where I want to head towards um, one of my major concerns in this report is around workforce. Um, I think that the, the workforce at the County Council are under incredible pressure, um, as, as is the case in, in a huge number of public services, where people are trying to manage um, their normal workload, as well as having to take on an incredible amount of um, COVID work. Uh, I think we need to recognise that and make sure that we are giving our workforce absolutely every bit of support that we possibly can um, and being as flexible and as supportive in to them as we possibly can. Um, and within that, I want to come on to um, the, the whole um, the question of working from home. Um, which we are all being asked to do as much as, as, as is feasible. Um, and I know that the, the vast majority of the council's workforce who can are working from home. I have some concerns about how much pressure and how much support is being given to people who are working from home in less than um, satisfactory circumstances. Um, there are an awful lot of us who are lucky enough to um, be able to work in a quiet room in our house that is not the kitchen. Um, I know that there are a number of members of staff for whom and, and other um, people working with the council for whom that is not straightforward. Um, and I, I'd really like to have some feedback from the officers on how we are supporting members of staff who find working from home difficult. Um, and also how we are managing, making sure that the concerns about this one is that um, I, I'm, I hope that undue pressure is not being put or, or significant pressure is not being put on staff to work from home if they are not comfortable to do that. Um, and there are many reasons why people might find it difficult to work from home. Um, it might be to do with um, just the physical space that they're in, people who are in very crowded accommodation, it can be very difficult to concentrate um, or, uh, and it can be very bad for your mental health if you're effectively being forced to work in a single tiny room in your building. 
Um, there are also people who have caring responsibilities for whom working from home um, can be extremely difficult and extremely stressful. Um, so, so a bit of feedback on that would be really helpful. I'm also slightly concerned that when people are being um, enabled to come into the office, um, that they are um, being given the maximum opportunity to work in um, spaces which are safe. Uh, and I know that some of our offices are open plan offices and some of them are not. And I've heard that that I think some of the less open plan ones are not available to people. And I'm just wondering whether that's wise in the current circumstances. I think, for example, Shah Hall, which in many ways is a rather ancient and unsatisfactory building to for uh, as a modern office because it doesn't have um, it has many small offices actually um, in a COVID situation. Uh, if people are able to work in smaller workspaces, actually that in some ways is safer. So I'd just like a little bit of feedback on that, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, uh, Lucy. I see uh, Gillian, our chief executive, has got her hand raised and I'm sure she'd like to uh, take on board, uh, respond to some of the comments about the workforce and the support that uh, I've been discussing with her and how we're in short, trying to ensure the, the, the degree of flexibility. So over to you, Gillian. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Netzinger, for um, your comments and, and questions, I think, in a really, really important area of, of, of the work that uh, we're doing with our workforce, making them safe and secure during COVID-19. Um, it's, it's true to say um, that our workforce largely have been working from home, um, uh, but fairly um, a few months ago, we did a, a comprehensive survey of our workforce um, where we asked uh, everybody what their experience was of, of their current working situation. Um, and uh, we took the results of that uh, and created some clear actions around what needed to be done. Um, and not surprising, one of the issues um, was around home working. Um, and so a comprehensive plan and contact has been made with uh, each and every member of staff around working conditions at home and what equipment they may need in addition to what they've already got at home. Uh, and also, I think the point you made around are, is working from home in a particular case acceptable if they're perching on uh, a sofa uh, on their knee with their, uh, their laptop? Is, is this a case where we would have to return that person back into a work environment? So all of those kind of assessments were done of people's uh, home working uh, situation. But another area which you've covered came out was uh, some people struggling working from home, um, the loneliness of it and the lack of contact with others. And actually today you'll see I'm in Shire Hall um, and we have certain people working from the Oregon. Some of those are staff that need to work together because there uh, is a need for that. But there are some people who have asked to come back because of their concerns, our concerns about their mental health and their need to come into the work environment. And uh, uh, I've, I've checked that, that out and in fact we've got one person working uh, in our area today um, who wanted to come back. So I would say that we've done comprehensive assessments, uh, we've uh, engaged with individuals, uh, we've looked at work environments at home and equipment that um, individuals need um, and we've worked um, through line management on that basis. Um, and we have returned some of our staff to buildings where as I say, either they need to work together as a team. So a good example are uh, social workers, children's social workers who sometimes have uh, some very difficult things that they're having to do uh, in their cases and the need for them to be able to come into uh, a COVID safe work environment to talk through a particular case and um, that is particularly stressful or difficult. And we've been given some examples of that. Uh, and that came out actually in the, you know, the wide survey that we did as staff. I think the other thing that's been really important is that we've also commissioned, um, not only for members, but also for staff, a mental health training from a, a recognised organisation. Uh, and we've offered that to staff. Uh, and that's not a, about just um, managers managing staff. It's about helping you with your own mental health, understanding what it means to have good mental health uh, and recognising signs in yourself. When you, when you need to perhaps raise it with a manager or take some action, but also managers being able to recognise that with staff and have the right kind of conversations because we recognise that the different working environment that people find themselves in at home, or indeed if, even if they're in a work environment, they might be anxious about, is it COVID secure? So we've, we've taken that on board too. So far as the buildings are concerned, I can, uh, having walked around Shire Hall this morning, 
um, it's it's clean to an nth degree. Um, the um, they have obviously cordoned off areas which um, they can't keep safe, uh, and a, there's a cleansing regime which is um, extremely rigorous, uh, and the social distancing, the hand washing, and all of those mechanisms that Councillor Count describes are absolutely in place here. Um, if any member hears any concern from a member of staff who, and we've we put out a communication probably only four weeks ago to reach out to staff who may have felt that they can't say that they're suffering from home, please contact us. We'd want to talk to you and we want to be able to return you to the workplace. Uh, we've also done now recently in the last week, um, I had a conversation with uh, Councillor Hickford around, um, you know, the issue about emails and, you know, the deluge of uh, emails and also the fact that we're going back to back and how we can take this a step further in terms of staff welfare and, and we're starting to think about you know what other working practices could we introduce for our workforce uh, to, to make sure that we look after their health and welfare so I think it's a comprehensive detailed approach we've taken good practice from elsewhere uh, but as I say if any member is concerned about any member of staff please let us know we're there to help them and we can make uh, arrangements, we can be flexible out their working arrangements and we can help them out because we do not want anybody to feel that they can't raise issues with us and we can't solve their problems. Gemma, I hope that gives you a comprehensive view of what we've done so far. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you. Uh, moving on then, uh, Councillor Elisa Machini. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I'm very pleased to have heard all of that. That was very, very useful and, you know, I absolutely echo everything that's been said, including, you know, thank you very much to everyone for keeping at it, despite the fact that you have to rewrite all your documentations every five minutes. And, you know, it's, it's, I don't think, I mean, I don't know, I've not been here for very long, but I'm not entirely sure anyone's ever had a budgetary period like this. And, you know, it'll be an interesting one to tell our children. I don't know. Um, but anyway... I do have two questions. I mean, the first one is about the extra funding that we talked about, one point, whatever it was, billion, um, which obviously we don't know yet um, how it's going to be distributed. But I was just going to ask, because from what I heard, um, no words, disqualifying words were ever uttered. But, you know, the impression I have been given is that that funding being awarded is tier dependent. And is that the case? or not, in which case, you know, in order for us to be able to get any of it, we need to get into worse restrictions. So I was wondering whether that was me misunderstanding the news or if it was actually the expectation. Um, so that's one question. And the second question is about, um, hang on a second, let me bring it up. So when we discuss staff and the fact that some of them, um, I will find it, I swear, um, it's just here where it says uh, currently, et cetera, et cetera, 35 people. Do. This is section 4.3.1, where it says we have had 35 people diagnosed with the virus. Currently, there are nine, five of whom are continuing to work at home and four are unable to. I was just going to check that these four are officially on sick leave or what are the arrangements for them? Um, I'm presuming they're on sick leave. Um, so, so, that, so those are my two questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Machini. Uh, I saw um, Chris Mallion's hand go up when you asked the question about the uh, one billion pounds that the government has allocated as further funding. I think Tom indicated earlier that um, he may have some more information on this. So I'm going to bring Chris in then. Chris. Uh, Chairman, uh, in, in part, uh, I, I don't have any more additional information in terms of the distribution methodology, which was the point that, uh, that Tom was, was highlighting. Uh, we are still waiting, uh, and I think um, the two things are linked because the, the announcement by the government uh, was around um, a total package of one and a half billion pounds, uh, and half, half a billion pound of that was in relation to the, the point that Councillor Machini has raised uh, in relation to specific interventions uh, for those that are in uh, Tier 3. Um, and as you know, a very public discussions going on uh, with Greater Manchester in terms of the support package that is uh, not yet or wasn't agreed this morning, um, uh, which is due to come in, into play from uh, 12 o'clock today. Uh, so there, there's um, uh, half a billion pounds for those specific interventions, which uh, we will not benefit from. But there's also a, a general one billion pounds uh, available for all local authorities. And that, that's the bit that we're waiting for the distribution methodology uh, to be uh, announced. 
I suspect, uh, given the, the amount of focus there is on the upper tier of, um, sorry, upper tier, the tier three level interventions, uh, they're seeking to try and address that before they go into the more basic distribution methodology. But we'll update members as soon as we know. Okay. Um, and could I ask, uh, does any officer have uh, any indications on the four people who are unable to work and off sick with coronavirus, please? Um, start speaking, Julian or Amanda. Yeah, I'll, I'll come in, uh, Chairman. Um, those, those will most likely be off sick um, if they're unable to work from home. Um, so, um, but without the specific details of the individuals, but that would be my, uh, my understanding. Okay, so without identifying the individuals, could we have circulated at a, a later date uh, what actually happens in these cases, as long as we don't identify the individuals, please? Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, next one, Councillor Noel Kavanagh. Yeah, my, my question's uh, relating to uh, preparing for the second phase down at uh, 424. There's reference to um, the test and trace um, gold uh, meeting three times a week. And um, I was just thinking, uh, you know, in the light of the kind of national feedback that um, the test and trace systems are problematic in certain areas, I was just wondering how test and trace is performing in Cambridgeshire. And um, I mean, it's very impressive that there's a team here meeting three times a week. So I imagine that team has access to plenty of data. And as we know, as we're, it looks as though we're entering, you know, the second phase, how important it is to have the test and trace operating very effectively. Thanks a lot. Okay. Do I have uh, an officer who wishes to come in on the test and trace data? Gillian. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, so the, um, the three weekly meetings um, look at, uh, at the, what we call the epidemiology, so the figures at those meetings, um, and understand uh, per uh, district and per area what is actually happening. Um, and plans are obviously put in place as a result of under uh, that understanding. It's fair to say we look at data every day, seven days a week. So I will see data every, uh, seven days a week. The Director of Public Health will see data seven days a week. Um, that data is not just sitting there. It gets passed on to what we call an outbreak management team. Uh, and if necessary, um, because action needs to be taken, something called an incident management team will be set up. Um, and that will look specifically at the actions required uh, in relation to the data that we've got. Um, and that happens, as I say, every day, um, so that we we are you know we get ahead of uh, or we deal with the situation that's currently facing us. Um, the data is good; it's much better. It gives us uh, uh, what we need to know uh, uh, in relation to what action we need to take. So, is it a, a trend, is it data that relates to a workplace? Is it relating to a community? Is it relating to a school? Um, and as I say, that data passes through a very clear set. Uh, of actions uh, resulting in action taken on the ground, which is what is actually ultimately important. Um, at the moment, um, that will continue because, as we can see across the country, uh, the virus is, um, the virus numbers are rising. Uh, and so there is a forensic and day to day, and will continue to be uh, effort in relation to making sure we take the right actions on the ground to, to suppress uh, the virus uh, from uh, rising any further. So. That, that's where we are at the moment. That gives you an idea of the kind of rhythm of meetings and degree of care we take over uh, looking at the data and making sure we take action. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Can I just add in on that point, um, the fact that test, track and trace is one tool in the box. Um, and we cannot, we cannot let the individuals in Cambridgeshire be over-reliant on that being a panacea if you had a 100% result that that will solve everything. And the reason for that is because there are a large amount of asymptomatic people out there and no amount of testing, tracking and tracing will ever be able to identify and deal with those. So the barriers to defence against those comes back to what I was saying earlier, hands, face, 
space. It's really important that the people recognize that somebody they're sitting opposite to that could be entirely healthy in their appearance, may be passing on the virus, may never be subjected to a te test, track and trace because they're purely asymptomatic. And that is one of the reasons that this hidden disease is so difficult to stop the spread of in our communities because it is absolutely invisible on occasion. So just re reiterate every opportunity you can to the individual, that hands, space, face message. Uh, thank you, Gillian, and thank you, Noel. Noel. Uh, Sebastian. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I wonder whether it is uh, possible that we could talk a little bit about the um, actual recommendation, which is to note the um, allocation in relation to the school's condition uh, surveys and allocations. Is that, uh, uh, am yeah, I jumping the gun? Okay, great. Uh, so I thought this was really interesting um, uh, key funding change um, because effectively what we've accepted is that we have a lot of schools in Cambridgeshire where um, there is uh, a building element that is not uh, great and we've been given funding to uh, uh, take steps to resolve a certain amount. And the report is very clear that um, although we're talking about uh, an extra 1.6 million, in fact, that's not going to go very far and not going to cover very many schools and resolve very many problems. So I was a little surprised to see that the half million pound prudential borrowing that we had uh, previously allocated um, was then going to be removed. It would have seemed to me that if we're going to uh, address the problem of the condition of our schools, um, this extra 1.6 million uh, would be uh, uh, better or, or, or further improved by including the 0.5 million prudential borrowing to make uh, a, a slightly larger sum of just over 2 million. And I wondered what the sort of um, thinking behind the removal of the prudential borrowing allocation was. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, now, uh, which officer would like Sebastian, to Sebastian, even. Oh, good Lord. Sorry, Sebastian. My if it was anyone else, I wouldn't have minded quite so much. No, sorry. I'm flick uh, apologies. I'm flicking behind uh, screen, so I didn't have your face up at that point in time. I was working from memory. Please accept my apologies. Uh, which of uh, Chris, if you would like to take that one, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Um, we did have a, a we we do have a very detailed uh, investment plan, uh, which was which was approved as part of the budget process. Uh, which was done on, on, on an assessment of, of uh, need in terms of uh, the high areas priority. Um, the uh, at the same so since that the budget was set, uh, the service has gone through some additional uh, reviews in uh, undertaking an assessment of additional investments required. Uh, hence the reason why this has now come forward. It it, it is fortuitous in some ways uh, that the additional request for funding uh, from the school service coincided with some additional funds that have been allocated by the government. Um, so this has been done based on purely on, on a need as assessment. Um, and uh, the reason why it's, it's not 1.6 million is, is that there's uh, at this point, uh, no additional demands over and above that which have been allocated in, in the report uh, have been requested or, or identified. Should there be additional need that does come forward, obviously uh, we would review that as part of the overall capital programme. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, thank you Chris. Um, Chairman, if I could come back on that. So uh, uh, just for absolute clarity, if um, a series of schools came forward and the, um, the projects that they needed to, uh, to improve the premises were listed and came to more than two million, are you saying in that case, Chris, that uh, you would go back to that uh, half million prudential borrowing and pop it back in the budget? I mean, obviously, it's, this process isn't as simple as that, but is, is, is that what you are effectively saying? Or are you saying that, um, you know, the entire budget would have call on that prudential borrowing and it might go to, you know, social care or, or uh, children in need or whatever? Not children in need, uh, looked after children. Chairman, if, if, if I may uh, respond to Councillor Kindersley's uh, uh, supplementary uh, through you. Um, I suppose, that in, in essence, I'm, I'm saying that if additional requests are, are identified, which are based on, on uh, actual need, 
uh, and you know, there, there's quite a, a sort of a, a high threshold and, and detailed work, as you say, uh, to go through before uh, that comes a bit comes forward. But if if that is a clearly identified uh, resource requirement, I would bring that back to this committee for uh, additional capital resources. And I think we do need to put it into context that the, the council were already um, supplementing the, the funds that government uh, had identified. So we we had already done up on a priority based. Uh, assessment and um, you know, we are putting effectively putting additional resources into that program we're not reducing resources we're actually putting additional resources uh, over and above that was a good, which was agreed in the budget okay thank you chris uh councillor mark goldsack thanks uh, chair um just thought i'd uh Add a little bit of, uh, of, of good for good news, really, to the to the uh, debate. Uh, we're talking about COVID secure and how we're looking after our staff. Um, I'm actively involved in the COVID secure build that's going on up at Alconbury. Uh, not only is it being built uh, in a very very uh, excellently managed way, uh, totally aware of COVID, um, we've actually revised the air quality, the space management, the layouts. Uh, the furniture design, the, the actual build of the furniture, and even the, the new breakout areas to make sure that we are absolutely on point as far as uh, the working environment will be. And I have led the officers there to say that I would rather you come back to me and tell me issues on delays and budget to make sure that this building is correct. This is not an exercise to get this building open at a certain time. So I can assure you at this moment that we're on budget and everything is looking good. And we have made all of those changes, which I think any staff that's going to be up there will be most welcome. And uh, I think the top and out ceremony for it is next week. So things are moving at quite a pace. Thought I'd add that, Chair. Thank, thank you for that, Mark. Uh, Councillor Lorna Dupre. Uh, good morning. I've got a couple of questions about this report. The first one is on 4.2.1 and redeployed staff on page 16 of the bundle. Um, and I wondered how the preparations for this fitted in with the Think Communities um, transformation bid that we recently approved. Um, part of the thinking around the, the transformation bid, as I understood it, was um, that we might not be redeploying staff in such numbers in the event of a second wave of COVID. COVID. And I wondered how um, the numbers of redeployment being uh, expected for a potential second wave compared with the numbers to, uh, which, who were redeployed in the first wave and how those staff and how the whole thinking behind that linked together with the um, transformation bid and the staffing arising from that. My other question was on Appendix 3, and the five key areas of risk of harm to the population, in particular, um, A, poor health outcomes. And um, the report was very clear about the risk of death um, in the vulnerable population. It was also clear about the um, different levels of vulnerability, for example, with uh, people in areas of deprivation and the BAME communities. Um, what it didn't mention was the increasing interest in and concern about what's now being called long COVID and the younger and generally healthier and fitter population who um, contract COVID, um, a number of whom, quite a number of whom, I think, are left with longer term, very debilitating conditions that may also mean that they have difficulty holding down their job, uh, retaining their home if they can't work, um, and may also need to rely on services. Uh, and I wondered whether, I wondered what attention was being given to the, uh, to long COVID as a potential impact that we should be looking at and bearing in mind. Uh, thank you for those questions, uh, Councillor Dupre. Dupre. Uh, on the first one, the redeployed staff, I'm going to bring uh, Amanda Askham in in uh, one second on that. But I think it's important to recognise that when, when coronavirus 
first arrived on these shores and, and we had to deal with it in Cambridgeshire, that the speed at which we managed to redeploy staff, uh, willing staff, and the commitment that they gave to actually help us deal with this and our communities uh, was incredible. And uh, many, many occasions in the past, and I'll say it again, thank you to all of our staff for the way that, they, that, that they've been hired. Um, we've known for a little while now that the, um, the likelihood of a second wave has been increasing. And I thought it was absolutely vital that we get on top of that rather than a reactive stance in a proactive stance that we actually plan this time how we're going to do and, and deal with that so that we're ready for when it arrives. And, and I think this short paragraph is just a snippet of the work that's gone in that area. So I'm just going to pass over to Amanda now who can really uh, explain some more of that. But that's the thinking behind it. And as you say, it's just a snippet you've got in front of you. Uh, Amanda. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. And, and thank you, Councillor Dupre, for the questions. I'm going to hand over to uh, Tom Barden, who's joined us for the second part of your question. But just on the on the redeployment issue, um, absolutely, as, as Councillor Count says, when we first responded with redeployment, it was in a crisis and emergency. We assembled quickly around that, redeployed a lot of staff uh, and took on the work and setting up the hubs very quickly. The reason we could set up those hubs quickly was because of our two years of work on Think Communities and our ability to, to leverage resources in from many partners uh, across the system. So the Think Communities transformation bid, uh, which we brought at the last meeting, talked about accelerating that Think Communities thinking and sort of proving it and testing it through COVID. So, so that bid was about saying, we now want to take this and put a structure in place for the next few years to really capture the learning and, and the will and the desire of the system to work in that Think Communities way. So we absolutely will have those people set up as Think Communities, which gives us the backbone of our response in the future. In addition to that, uh, absolutely, as Council Count says, we've been doing a lot of work over the last month planning for the next stage of redeployment. So what we want to have um, in the next phase is an understanding of the skills that we can bring to different pieces of work. We want people to be appropriately trained for that redeployment. Uh, so we put in that training has started and has been ongoing for the last three weeks. Uh, and that's in all sorts of different areas that we anticipate we might need. Uh, we've also got a list of staff who we've talked to individually as managers to talk about what redeployment might mean for them to make sure that we're putting appropriate people into appropriate spaces. Um, and we're doing a modeling forward modeling of different um, scenarios in line with our business planning work, which says in, in different scenarios, we'll need different numbers of staff to be redeployed. So we're doing a lot of work um, on redeployment that's being led by Adrian Chapman, and it goes absolutely hand in hand with the Think Communities approach. So, so, so you're absolutely right. The two things are, are part of the same response. One is a backbone in Think Communities, which draws together that redeployment. And the other is, is all the work we're doing to wrap around making sure we're, we're ready for action um, when we need to redeploy people. And we're starting that already. Um, I'll ask Tom to come in on the question about uh, long COVID and how that relates to the pendants work. We probably won't go into a lot of detail here, but that's certainly something we can bring into the workshop that we're having on the 13th. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Amanda. Um, uh, it's an, it, thank you, Councillor Dupre. Um, it's an excellent point um, about the issues of um, impacts of long COVID. Um, obviously, as time has gone on, then we've learned more and more about um, about the emerging impacts, this being a very, very novel disease. Um, this the work um, and the issues raised in the in, in that report will be being picked up by the the various um, subgroups of the recovery board, um, including um, one focused on public health and, and, and health protection, as well as by the relevant elements by service committees here. So um, I'd expect that the, as we understand more about things like long COVID and other emerging impacts, that those things are picked up and taken forward under those, um, under those cross system and council committees. Thank you for that, uh, Tom. Okay, Lorna. Um, I think I might need to come back to the officers on both of those points. I think I, I was interested in a little more specifics, but I'll come back to them offline. Thanks. As mentioned, we also have the workshop to go into that at detail on the 13th of November. So uh, perhaps if you can't get it there, we'll, we'll deal with it in the workshop. Uh, Councillor David Jenkins. Thank you, Chair. Um, a short while mm. ago, um, Gillian gave us a, a pretty comprehensive review of what's going on to address any outbreaks that may be coming 
Um, and in the paper 424 uh, tells us all about the many, many meetings taking place to make sure that we spot them and then can respond to them. Um, we have been alerted to an outbreak at Homerton College. I wonder how many more outbreaks are currently ongoing in the county and can Gillian tell us how many there are and how big they are? Uh, thank you, thank you, David. So, as as I believe that all members have circulated with the full list of outbreaks at any educational setting, uh, many of those cases are, uh, there are there in some of those cases there's no isolation necessary either with pupils or staff. Uh, in terms of uh, other outbreaks, uh, that goes through the public uh, health directorate. And again, we make all that information available to um, members. In fact, the Homerton College has been made available to, to yourselves and members as well. So um, I think all of that information is being circulated, uh, Councillor Jenkins. So can you then confirm that Homerton College is the only significant outbreak? Um, you, uh, who, who wishes to come in on that, yeah, Julie? Um, I can I can answer that. So that's the most significant outbreak uh, in the university settings. Um, and uh, I would say at the moment um, we circulated a paper to you about the way in which we uh, had worked really hard with the universities to that, so they could forge their own uh, outbreak management plans. Um, and I would say as well, just to uh, emphasise what Council Council said, each day um, and every day we know. Uh, what the outbreaks are, as we know outbreak is two or more. So actually, um, you know, you will see a, a big list of, uh, of outbreaks across the, the whole county. Um, and each of those outbreaks are looked at every day, uh, making sure that action's being taken, whatever that might be, to ensure that the outbreak comes in control, is dealt with, um, uh, and, uh, and then there'll be another one and the same will apply. So, and there are varying degrees in different places but I think the thing that you need to know is that those are managed and reported and looked at on a daily basis. Um, and uh, there's no secrecy around it. It's quite, um, we're quite happy to share that information and indeed it has been shared uh, so far. Um, thank, thank you, Gillian. And, and yes, it's correct. We do get the summary of the outbreaks in schools. Um, but, and we were told about the outbreak at Homerton. But as far as I'm concerned, we don't have any information about other outbreaks in the community, in workplaces or whatever. Chairman, I'll go back and check that with the Director of Public Health and come back to the committee on that one. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Julian. Uh, just before we, before we move on, I just wanted to um, uh, uh, add some clarity or, or re reiterate what Julian said, an outbreak is two or more. So when we mention a big list of outbreaks, um, please do not run off to the newspapers with some scary headline, this big list of outbreaks in Cambridgeshire, because it sounds absolutely awful and every outbreak is awful. But when they are literally down in the twos, you get a long list, but you don't get as many people as you might think by that statement. So I uh, just wanted to re-emphasize how Julian introduced that. Uh, Councillor Bywater. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Just coming on the back of that, really, is that uh, I think we can be confident our schools are managing extremely well, really, and um, any any case is reported immediately to our education settings. So, um, yeah, it's it's being managed very, very well. And and, and certainly when it comes to outbreaks, um, I'm I'm aware from my district hat on that they are managed within our district councils as well. So, um, but just moving on to some positives, Chairman, I just want to. Um, just talk about page 20 on the report um, uh, in relation to Duxford and the fire that we had at Duxford School. I think it's important to get on public record um, how brilliant our staff did in relation to getting that school back on track literally four weeks before we they were due to go back to school uh, were faced with this devastating fire at the school and um, with an immense amount of teamwork from the get-go, we had officers there pretty much as they were damping down the fire uh, to a sort of four-week turnaround to get our children back into school there was absolutely fantastic. So, and I've been down to visit the school, the, the positivity coming out of the school from the head and staff is absolutely brilliant. So I just wanted to put it on record that, you know, when we are faced with significant challenges, we can deliver. So thank you. 
Th thank you, Councillor Bywater, and I'm glad you did, did range that because it gives me an opportunity just to shine a light on the children's services throughout Cambridgeshire and just how well they've been performing, a real star in our armoury and our battle, battle against coronavirus. The, the full risk analysis that went through on every single educational the schools before they were reopened was exemplary in our area. And I think that has played no small part in keeping the coronavirus infection levels low in our part of the country. I, I have no doubt with the trajectory that we will go up, so, so will other areas. But I do think that we, we should recognise the sheer effort that we went into here and the team's part in that in trying to make ourselves as prepared as possible. Uh, really well done in getting those schools open. And I think that's been reflect, reflected in the student numbers because we've got a very high attendance rate compared to a lot of the uh, Eastern region in both our mainstream schools and our special needs schools. So uh, compliments to the team, well done, and particularly in the turnaround on that fire situation. Uh, Councillor Kindersley. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, could I come back to make two small points um, in relation to numbers on uh, outbreaks and so on? The first is that Public Health England um, publish the weekly report um, using um, uh, super output areas because apparently county council divisions, district council wards and parish boundaries uh, didn't make the whole situation complicated enough. So the result is that, um, just to be parochial for a moment, uh, the neighbouring um, uh, super output area to Gamlingay village is in the second highest risk area. And uh, despite the fact that immediately adjacent to very small villages such as Wesley, it does also include Love's Farm at St Neots. So there is a sort of odd um, situation with how Public Health England are presenting figures. Uh, which I think we all need to be, you know, well aware of. Um, the second point I'd like to make is that, of course, Cambridgeshire is not an island, and many of our divisions, uh, certainly mine, to be parochial again, uh, border other authority areas who have very different um, levels of uh, infection currently. Uh, so uh, Central Bedfordshire uh, produces a weekly report based around um, parish infection, uh, ward infections, uh, so, you know, I see that this week North Biggleswade has eight cases, South Biggleswade has eight cases and Potton has four cases. But those are not apparently um, uh, notified to anybody except councillors within mid-beds and are certainly not notified to uh, neighbouring councillors or possibly even neighbouring authorities, I don't know. Um, so those of us on the borders, um, you know, try to keep an eye on um, how infection levels are in our neighbouring uh, um, uh, districts and counties. Uh, it can be a bit tricky. And of course, um, you know, people are like water, they go everywhere. And so I do occasionally say on Facebook pages for my villages, um, you know, just be aware that uh, rates are increasing faster in Bedford, for example. Um, and um, people decide that perhaps they won't go shopping there for that, that afternoon. Uh, so just two points to perhaps be aware of. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Kendersley. I think this whole area of uh, infection rates and super output areas and, and wards is it, quite a complicated one. And Public Health England published their lists in their way um, because they're worried about the uh, deprecation of the, um, of the evidence base once you start trying to get to too low a granular level. Uh, circumstances change so quickly when you're talking about ones and twos in certain areas, when you're relating to that to a per 100,000 100, figure for the population. So somebody might be extremely high in the per 100,000 population list, but because they've only got a small population, it might only be one case. Um, so that reason that all of the um, epidemiology meetings that go on between Julian Beasley, uh, Liz Robin and the others in the SCG, they examine all of this evidence in much finer detail. In fact, if you get into the position with where you're discussing these uh, with governments, they take so many factors into account, such as how many of that those numbers are over 60, therefore likely to go into hospital. Is it embedded in one care home? Uh, was the genealogy spread in one area or on the way to one area or out of one area? Are we confident that whoever's got it in that area, the measures immediately taking place have got it under control? And so it, it's all of that evidence that's going on in the background that are working around these figures that is absolutely vital 
that people who, who can understand them and break them down get a hold on it, rather than just concentrating on the main figures that we all seem to see in the newscast every day of the week. So I hope that helps you in having some comfort just about the wealth of information and background work that goes on to try and deal with any numbers that they find on a daily basis. Uh, Councillor Dupre. Yes, the, I wanted to, to come back quickly on two things. Firstly, yes, there is a lot of data out there, but it does need to be interpreted uh, in the light of what we know. And one of the things that we do know is that there there is actually very little tracing, uh, uh, testing of the population. And therefore, the actual figures on the government dashboard, useful as they are in comparing places, are nonetheless only uh, as good as the, the, the number of, of tests that are available. But it is helpful information, uh, and it needs to be balanced off against other useful information, such as, for example, the King's College London COVID-19 app, which is very good at providing... Um, estimates based on the 4 million people who are reporting on, on that app. Um, so that's really important. I would encourage people to download and use that app to report how they are. Um, the, the second point was I, I really do think we need to be careful about this growing um, story that low rates of infection are our reward for being good and high rates of infection are our punishment for being bad or, or behaving badly and it's not as simple as that yes of course we will have responsibilities as individuals and as organizations to do the right thing keep ourselves and others safe as best we can however it is absolutely well known and the um, appendix three of this report makes it crystal clear that um, high rates of uh, infection particularly in the north of the country, um, very much track deprivation. They track the outfall of, of the decade of austerity that we've had. Um, they are very much driven by factors other than whether people wash their hands or not. And washing our hands, yes, is important, but we are fortunate uh, as much as anything. And we, we need to continue to do the right thing, but not regard that as a low rate of infection as being some sort of virtue uh, when it is in some measure at least down to us having the good fortune to be in a relatively prosperous area of the country. Uh, thank you, Councillor um, Dupre, for your comments. I, I must say that I, I don't uh, naturally agree with everything you've said. So, um, for example, saying that we live in a, a prosperous area, it might be fine for some people that live in the south of the uh, county. But, of course, the north of the county is in the top decile for areas of multiple deprivation. So it's not true of all of Cambridgeshire that we live in uh, rich and affluent areas. Uh, but I'd also like to say that nobody said um, in this meeting that I'm aware of, and I've certainly not heard it, that low rates are due to good or bad people, you know, in the way that they behave. But I don't want anybody to dampen down the message that we're giving out, that your first line of defence is what you do yourself. If you maintain your distance, if you wash your hands, you know, that, that typical message, which we're trying to get out, hand, space, face, is the most important thing every individual can do to maintain their resilience against the coronavirus. And I don't want anybody to label that as good as bad. It's just common sense. The more you can do for yourself, the less you rely on other people to protect you. So please don't dampen down that message. On the terms of, of lack of testing, um, you know, I feel that I've got to just bring some uh, evidence to light on that. One of the most uh, renowned sites for um, world, world um, coronavirus is the world ometers that anybody can download onto their computer. And in tests per million population, Oh, there are no countries the size of the UK above us in tests per million population. You might get somebody like the Faroe Islands or, or, or Denmark or something like that. But in terms of tests per million population, the UK for its size is absolutely leaps and bounds ahead of the rest. And so therefore it's not true to say that there's very low levels of testing. Uh, what I would like to see, and we are working on, is actually increasing the amount of testing in every single area of, of the UK. And we're actually working, trying to see what 
what we could do in Cambridgeshire. But I'm going to revert back to something I said earlier. There are a lot of asymptomatic people out there that aren't being tested. And it's virtually impossible unless we test the entire population on a daily basis to deal with that. So we must go back to the hand space face uh, advice uh, as the first line of defense. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Noel Kavanagh. Oh, thanks, Steve. It's definitely me because I, I haven't got a background which makes me look as though I'm on the set of Brideshead Revisited or whatever. <laughs> but um, one of the um, outcomes of um, the special measures that have been brought in and, and, and the COVID uh, traumatic time we're going through is uh, I'm pleased to see, you know, the this, this school streets initiative it's been implemented um, as pilots in outside, uh, outside some schools during peak times. And um, the feedback I've had from a school in my area is that uh, people are hugely positive about it. And um, you all might remember, I did bring a motion in the past about having no, no car zones outside schools during uh, peak hours. And um, it's very good that um, you know, the Children and Young People Committee and the Health Committee kept kept that um, notion alive. It's been a good thing. And isn't it interesting that many people are now seeing it as a positive that's come out of the difficult times we're in with COVID-19, a positive that we're able to try out this experiment and seeing how schools are getting on without the huge number of cars descending at the, on their gates, you know, in the morning and in, and in the afternoon. So it'd be interesting to know at the end of all this, if, if we could have some kind of um, analysis, you know, a report on, to see how it goes. And, and perhaps these measures might become permanent if the outcomes have been generally regarded as being positive. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, th thank, thank you, uh, Noel. Yeah, I remember, mm. I remember your motion well. We also had uh, uh, Councillor Peter Hudson brought that to the fore on his motion on air quality, uh, and I, I had a different one where we talked much more about what the use of the lanes, etc. Um, and all of these are, are being rolled out throughout Cambridgeshire in various, various degrees, trying to, in a real concerted effort to make a difference to the air quality. But I'd just like to um, bring out the fact that, that yet yeah, the coronavirus um, by accident has made a large difference in many areas to the, to the air quality. And we are trying to capture some of that information, not just in air quality, but in congestion and other factors. We were talking about the workforce eh, earlier and looking after and supporting our workforce. And I think that when we talk about our recovery plans, it isn't just going back to the old way of working. Some of the damage done by coronavirus has had positive effects, like the flexibility we've been able to afford the workforce to work from home, the reduction in congestion, the improvement in air quality. And what we do as we recover is we want to capture some of those uh, inherent benefits as much as possible uh, for the benefit of us all. So it's important that we recognize things such as the one you've just raised, raised and recognize where there have been benefits. How can we build them into a more sustainable uh, recovery plan for, for us for the future? I've got no other hands to speak. So I'll just cut, cover a couple of other things. Um, there was a, there was a, a mention of our, our ability to deliver a transformation and efficiencies throughout the site and it's a mugs game trying to guess what that is well you know Cambridgeshire County Council has a track record of about 10 years of delivering efficiency and transformation to enable us to hit budgets that have got quite serious uh, reductions in funding against them or, or increases in inflation and demand. And we've managed that year after year after year after year. So I don't quite accept that it's a mugs game when you predict at the start of the year, the transformation that you're going to bring in by the end of the year, because we've hit it so regularly. But I do say that we have a great record of also measuring what we have and haven't done. And whilst we talk about coronavirus impacts on efficiency savings this year, we can clearly identify what is coronavirus and what are driven and what is not. And we take remedial action in those cases. Um, 
I have been working very hard with Gillian on all the aspects of the workforce support that we've been talking about. And there will be more uh, efforts coming out in the near future where we've looked at other ways that perhaps we can fine tune the benefits of uh, some of the ways that the world has changed. And we're going to uh, see how our workforce feel about making some of those much more permanent. So uh, without anything further from myself or anyone else, I'd just like to uh, move to the recommendations. Uh, we've had some questions on the paper today, but I've not heard anybody speak against the paper. So I'm just gonna check uh, if, uh, is everybody happy that we take the, the report and the recommendations on the blockers approved if not, if I see a uh, raised hand, I shall go to a, to a vote. Okay, I'm saying, I believe there's a general consensus in support of the recommendations. So I will take them as carried. I'll now move on then to agenda item number five, the business planning proposals for 2021 to 26. Can I invite the... Um, uh, Chief Finance Officer Chris Mallion to introduce the report, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm afraid my introduction may be slightly uh, longer than uh, normal, but uh, hopefully, given the circumstances, you'll uh, give me that bit of uh, leeway. Uh, as members will be aware, this is the start of the planning process uh, and uh, will culminate uh, in the budget setting uh, in February uh, of next year. Uh, but as far as similarities uh, with previous business planning processes, that's probably about as, as close as it gets. When the Council uh, agreed the budget for the, for the current year, just uh, seven months ago in February uh, of 2020, the Council was in a relatively uh, good place uh, financially, uh, probably better than it had been for, for many, many years. Uh, at that point, uh, a balanced budget was set for the current financial year, 2021, and, and this was set without any use of uh, reserves. Uh, furthermore, the, the Council was able to forecast that there was only a budget gap of, of £4.2 million uh, for the financial year commencing the 1st of April 2021, uh, and this was predicated on the Council tax increase of 2%. Uh, in the scheme of, of previous year's challenges, uh, this was relatively modest and uh, was very, uh, and we've been able to demonstrate, uh, was very uh, achievable through previous performance. Uh, just over a month later, the country entered lockdown and the landscape understandably took a significant turn uh, for the worse. Uh, in a normal year, we would kick off the business planning process uh, with the opportunity to, to uh, reconsider and ev evaluate our relevant priorities uh, and which outcomes we might want to focus on uh, during uh, the business planning process for the following year. This year, it's difficult to move much beyond the finances, uh, albeit we must always consider where we wish to prioritise, even when it's uh, necessary to make budget cuts. We will therefore refer to the relevant priorities throughout the next two months as detailed proposals come forward for the committee's consideration. Given the amount of uncertainty around next year's budget, uh, the business, business intelligence team uh, and uh, Tom's on, on the call uh, have developed three scenario models using a wide range of data and potential outcomes uh, in order to create a range of financial forecast. Uh, as members will see from the, the, the report they have in front of them this morning, these scenarios result in a budget gap of between 30 and 80 million pounds or just over 80 million pounds. Uh, the modeling was de developed during uh, early autumn and as you might expect, the data sets are being updated uh, regularly. Uh, and we will share with members throughout the business planning cycle uh, any updates that we, that we have. Uh, I'm sure if members have any detailed questions regarding the modeling that the business, uh, sorry, Director of Business Improvement and Development uh, or Tom himself will be happy to answer those. Uh, it is clear, however, that even with the most optimistic of, of those outcomes that are set out in the paper, it is unlikely that the Council will be able to set a balanced budget for the financial year 21-22 without further tax increases, significant service reductions, significant use of reserves or government intervention. The most likely outcome uh, is, of course, that there'll probably be a mixture of all, all those uh, elements and mitigations. At the uh, Commercial Investments Committee the, uh, last week, Councillor Bowden did highlight the fact uh, that if we are in this position, we are not alone and many other councils up and down the country will be facing similar challenges and therefore the government will have to act in order to support councils through this process. Uh, there's certainly an element of, of, of truth in that, but at the moment we don't have that clarity. We do know that some councils are well ahead of Cambridgeshire in terms of their financial viability and are working with MHCLG uh, in respect of emergency support packages for the current financial year. 
there will undoubtedly, as a result of the ongoing uh, issues arising from COVID, be a plethora of councils seeking emergency support for next year, uh, particularly those like Cambridgeshire that have not carried significant unearmarked reserves on their balance sheet. Officers of this council have therefore contacted MHCLG early in order to start a dialogue with officers of the department uh, regarding potential emergency support for next year, as that is clearly our pivotal point, not, not this financial year. What is clear from those very early discussions is there is an expectation that councils uh, will do whatever is in their gift to minimise the, the need for government support. We will therefore be evaluating all of the mitigations that I mentioned earlier throughout the next two months alongside government officers, and we will update members throughout this process. Uh, Chairman and members, we have faced some pretty challenging business planning processes previously, where the solutions did largely sit within our own decision making. Uh, we have as a consequence, and this, this was a point highlighted by the Chairman uh, on the last item, we have as a consequence delivered significant efficiencies, transformation and income generating opportunities over the last decade that have largely covered the increasing demands faced as a result of being one of the fastest growing populations and economies in the country. This year, however, we face a challenge, the, a challenge that is beyond our control and the implications of which could simply make the council unsustainable without government help. We will continue to work on developing proposals to reduce the financial challenges we are facing, but we wanted to ensure that as we start the business plan process for 21-22, all members are aware of the current forecast. The report also does include uh, the detailed um, or some uh, overview of the implications appertaining uh, to the functions of, of this as a uh, GPC as a service committee, and they're set out in the paper, and also does set out uh, a broad timeline uh, for future papers uh, in relation to uh, the business planning process. Uh, I'll probably end, end it there, Chair, if I may, um, but I'm sure Tom, myself, uh, or Amanda will happy to take any questions on the detail of the content of the report. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chris, for that full uh, explanation and introduction. It's very useful to put it into quite some context. Uh, Councillor Kindersley. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman, uh, and thank you for that introduction to uh, what I find quite a complex and ultimately uh, slightly alarming uh, report. So I have three questions. Um, the first is, how are we likely to be impacted if, as is likely, the Bank of England requires us to move into negative interest rates uh, early next year? Uh, you'll be aware they've been approaching um, uh, the banks to ask if they have um, the mechanisms in place to cope with negative interest rates. So that is the first item that um, I'd like some clarity on. The second is, um, you'll be aware, obviously, that the Chancellor has been um, spending money on a scale hitherto undreamt of um, uh, to deal with the impact of coronavirus. And um, there is, of course, now a growing concern about how that money is to be paid back. And, um, uh, you know, I think I think all uh, uh, all parties accept that um, one of the mechanisms for, for for paying back that money is through taxation. So I'd be interested to know um, the views um, of our um, finance officer on whether or not the limit on the council tax increase will be raised, i.e. from above uh, to above 2%. And um, if so, uh, will it be a mandatory increase or will it be one that the council itself can choose to either set um, at or, or indeed not to accept at all? And my third question, I suppose, is, is a more political one, which is, um, I reading between the lines of this report, it would indicate that we would be, at the very least, foolish not to accept a council tax increase of the maximum permitted, uh, not only for adult social care, but also for the general, uh, for the general fund. Uh, and I wondered if, um, uh, Steve, you had views on that as leader of the council. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll just um, I'll ask Chris to come in in a second, but uh, some of these I can help with or, or, or see where we go. So the first one that, that my view on negative interest rates, and Chris will be able to give more detail on this, but the biggest impact on change on interest rates that people imagine for the council is on our borrowing. But actually our borrowing is already secured at various interest rates. Through our treasury management function, which we present to the GPC and full council, uh, 
on a regular basis, we always talk about the fact that we will re remortgage our borrowing, re refinance our borrowing as and when opportunities arrive. I, I, I remember arise, I remember probably about five months ago, we took advantage of 70 million pounds of, of changing the terms. And the reason we don't, can't do all of it, even if it goes to uh, negative interest rates, is because a lot of the borrowing, when you take it out, actually has ter have terms involved with penalty clauses. So therefore, if there is a new interest rate out that is favourable, um, you have to weigh up the cost of moving to that new interest rate um, against the penalty that you'll have to pay. One of the things we have asked MHCLG to consider is if they are PWLB rates that you're moving from one to the other to remove the penalty clauses so that it would be easier for us to swap onto lower interest rates as and when they come available. However, I think Chris may have some more information on whether there are other aspects of negative interest rates that would um, affect this council and certainly on some of our commercial returns that there, there may be impacts. It was quite interesting, the, the, the tie up between the second and third um, quotes that you had there. The second question that you had was about, um, and this is a question for Chris, whether he has in, any information on whether government will increase the, um, uh, the, the ability to increase local council taxation and whether it be mandatory or not and what those limits are. Now, I don't know if Chris has got any more information than I have and I'll go to him in a moment. But at the moment, the actual regulations are this 2% 2 limit. But, but you go on to ask, if that is relaxed, you ask me directly uh, as the Conservative leader of this county council, would I automatically go to the maximum permitted and it would be foolish not to do so? I can say categorically no. If the government says it's up to local councils to sort themselves out and it would take 15% to actually balance our books next year, I cannot ask the people of Cambridgeshire to put their council tax up 15%. I have to look at what else is on our balance sheet what other measures we could do to avoid that necessity and give a balanced approach to the people and the economy of Cambridgeshire? So categorically, no, I will not automatically go to a maximum permitted amount unless I know what that is and how what other options are in front of me. Now, I'm surprised you'd ask for that answer this early on when we don't have enough information to know how we will balance our books and what options are in front of us. But you can take that answer. No, I will not automatically go to a maximum permitted rate when I don't know what it will be. Thank you. Uh, Chris, over to you. Do you have some more information on <clears throat> what is or is not uh, permissible or any indications you have from government on these interest rates? Uh, Chairman, if, uh, through you, um... No, a simple answer is I, I, I don't uh, at this point in time. Obviously, it's, it's a matter we're, we're uh, monitoring uh, carefully and regularly. Um, just in terms of picking up a couple of points that, um, that you, you raised, uh, we do still carry quite a lot of debt uh, on a short term basis. Uh, I don't know that number off the, off the top of my head, uh, but Tom, Tom may know it. Um, but there is still there is still some potential flexibilities that, or benefits that we might accrue as a result of uh, negative uh, interest rates. Uh, as you rightly point out, the, the big issue uh, for us is our, our long-term dated debt, uh, which is largely PWLB, not exclusively, but largely PWLB, which is uh, fixed at the point of drawdown. Um, it is a, even though the negative, uh, the, the, you know, there, there's a potential of, of ne negative interest rates, um, the PWLB rate is not following uh, that downward trend. Um, the PWLB rates are, are driven by, by guilt returns. Um, and come picking up one of the other points that uh, Councillor Kindersley made, um, given the, the level uh, of indebtedness that the, the government uh, is currently facing, uh, it is going to have to fund that uh, one way or t'other, uh, and it will be you know, partly through taxation um, um, and, and partly through uh, additional borrowing. Additional borrowing is eventually going to seep its way through, um, if, you, if we ignore quantitative easing for a moment, it will seep its way, way, way through uh, into higher uh, PWLB rates. Uh, it, it has to, to work in that in that way. Uh, it, can't, it can't be avoided without a direct intervention. Um, if I may also, uh, and I, I, and without getting drawn into, into the politics of, uh, around uh, council tax, um, I think my personal view uh, is that the government have got to re re relax the council tax limitation regulations. Um, 
we, as, as we sit here today, the adult social care precept will um, uh, ceases in, in this year. So there is no, uh, in theory, uh, adult social care precept um, for, for next year. So it's, it's just core taxation. Uh, I think that was part of the government's uh, review that was intended uh, for this year. So we'll, I'm, I'm assuming it will still uh, remain part of their spending review uh, announcements going forward. Uh, but I, th I think that there's, uh, you know, it, it's just not comprehensible that they wouldn't uh, relax them. Now, what they relax them to, uh, you know, is a is a matter for debate. Uh, and whether they remove it, remove it completely, uh, you know, I, I just do not know uh, at this point uh, point in time. The thing um, I would say about uh, obviously council tax uh, increase, if, if that's used uh, uh, as um, um, either part or the majority of, of uh, our solution, and it and it can't be uh, just the the only solution, um, that is then embedded. Uh, in, in the council tax in perpetuity, we are facing short-term issues. So um, it's partly picking up uh, the chairman's point, but would you use a, a long-term intervention to deal with a short-term issue? Uh, I mean, we're hoping obviously that COVID is a short-term issue. Um, so uh, that's, that's probably all I wanted to say by the way, stop the chairman. Uh, th thank you, Chris. Uh, just one ad additional point, uh, which was the question of whether the government would mandate any uh, local council tax increases. Um, we don't have any information on that. But uh, from my point of view, I would, I, this is just a personal point of view, not a political one or a chairman's one. It's just a personal one. Uh, I think it would be quite unlikely because it removes the sort of flexibility that local government have. We know that we are an efficient, well-run council and have been with a, a quite a low general reserve of 3% of our revenue budget for many, many years now. And that is more than ample. Where it's, it's probably just not more than ample, not too little. It's like uh, Goldilocks's porridge, just the right amount for normal situations for this council to run in. And if it wasn't for the pandemic, that would be the no a, a, a reasonable amount to go through life with. But there are councils up and down the country that have different approaches uh, and they continue taxing their residents whilst they have enormous balance sheets uh, backing up their councils. So in their circumstances, I find it unlikely that the government would mandate a council tax increase when they actually have alternatives that we don't have here in Cambridgeshire. But that's just a personal opinion. Uh, Councillor Jenkins. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chris Mallion quite correctly referred to the CNI committee of last Friday and the remarks made about HMG not letting the whole sector of local councils down. Well, fingers crossed that turns out to be an accurate prediction. Um, the other thing we spent an awful lot of time on at CNI on Friday was um, paragraph 3.1 and paragraph 3.1.1 the scenarios for the future. And it must be manifestly obvious that the scenario A, which is what all this planning is based on at the moment, is, is absolutely wrong and history. You just have to look at the first bullet point there, a low likelihood of a second peak. Well, is 100% a low likelihood? I think not. So I think, Chair, it's important this committee knows what does scenario B look like and what does scenario C look like, because otherwise we can't have any meaningful debate about what the numbers for the future mean. Um, there was some debate on Friday as to whether we're now in A plus territory or B plus territory. I pessimistically tilt towards the latter but I don't know because we're not being given the information. So I think we should understand this chair and I hope we'll get it pretty quickly. The other thing we talked about is the, the need for this council, I guess, along with all other councils as well, to be agile in the way we adjust to changing conditions and managing, manage our information going forward. We've got a hard stop as to when we are obliged to put the budget together. But between now and then, we need to be able to do something to bring up-to-date information and process it quickly without getting involved in the tedious administration of what we normally do in the annual budgeting round. I don't know what the answer to that is, Chair, but you need to give our excellent officers freedom to do things in a different way going forward. Thank you. 
Uh, thank, thank you, David. Um, so I'll take you just uh, back to your first part, which is the 3.1.1 um, about the actual, whether it's A, a or B. Um, so uh, the, these three scenarios were worked up and they, they was, the, the service committees were then asked to map out what the likelihood of demand and interventions are necessary under three distinct scenarios. And if you take the first one, which you say is obviously not going to happen because the first bullet point is a low likelihood of a second peak requiring a further uh, national lockdown. You can see that the second peak is, is here, it's upon us. Uh, pretty much most of the country it's going that way, but it, we don't know if there'll be a further national lockdown. We know that there's localized lockdown. We also know at the bottom of the, the the, sorry, the third, the third bullet point, a vaccine is available within 12 months. Now, that, this report was written um, in the last few months, right? It may well be that a vaccine is available in the Christmas running through to spring area. We don't know. So there might be a more positive one. So it's impossible when you do scenario planning to actually nail all of the elements on the head, but you put basically a package of measures together for A, a package of measures for B, and a package of measures for C. And at this point in time, it was not possible for anybody to say with any certainty what our demands and impacts will be based on these scenarios. However, I think it's fair to indicate that uh, somewhere around the A plus B minus mark is where, where we believe we are at, the, at, the, at this present point in time. And that will leave a savings gap somewhere in the region of £40 million. Pounds, all right? We also know that this was written before the £1 billion pounds came out from government. So that will change that by who knows how much, which was it. But what we do know is we will keep getting information and fine tuning this, as we've seen with our in-year prediction coming true, that the two um, outside, the two different measurements have come together. We will see this happen, that our accuracy predicting will improve as we get more information. In February, as you know, um, this is going on to your second point, we passed the budget. And you're talking about the flexibility within that budget. For, for many years, it's actually some, a point that I've raised. In fact, when we introduced some midterm budgets in summer, it was you, Councillor Jenkins, who railed against them because we don't have budgets, but only once a year. And I said then that you have to have a flexibility in an organization of this size to move things about as and when. Now we use the actual GPC committee to do it in the past because after the budget is passed by the full council, there is actually flexibility completely built into the system under the chief, exec uh, chief executive to actually flex that using the committee system. So we are fast and we are agile, and it is something that we've been promoting in Cambridgeshire as an efficient organization for many years under my watch. So um, thank you for the comments, which really reinforces the way that we are working. And I would suggest that on the budget scenario planning, uh, we just keep the information flowing, put as much research in as we can and make every decision to the best of our ability on the information in front of us on that day. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Lucy. So if I may quickly come back. Uh, so, yes, certainly Councillor Jenkins, yeah. Um, you told me that you think the savings requirement is now of the order of 40 million um, based on information you hold, which you're not sharing with this committee. That's so, not what, that's not. I'd like to Jenkins. understand please, what please. scenario you're operating on the basis of. Please, please Councillor. Councillor Jenkins, listen to what I say. Don't try and put words in my mouth. I said, my personal opinion is we're somewhere in the A plus B minus. You've been told today as part of these papers that the bandwidth for the ABC scenarios are 30 to 80 million, all right? So I said, if you take an A plus B minus scenario, somewhere around the 40, but I can't be any more accurate than that. You haven't got papers in front of you of that. That's just a personal opinion. As you just said yourself, you were voicing various opinions from the CNI committee on Friday, where some people thought it was B plus, some people thought it was A minus. We're trying to work our best here with the facts and figures, but please don't promote that I've, I've got secret information uh, that you haven't got access to. Um, uh, and I, I think, if I may just go further, your understanding of my second point was not correct. I wasn't talking about flexibility of the budget itself. I was talking about flexibility in the budget making process to enable us to be more responsive to 
um, the outside world as it's changing and to relieve the officers of excessive amounts of detail and manipulation, which they might otherwise have to do. Yeah, just, just, just on that point, um, we do by law have to pass a balanced budget um, in time for the, through the February Council. That, that is a legal requirement. Uh, after we pass that legal budget, the main bit will be the uh, council tax increases, which go out to, to print on that. The flexibility is built in the system for us to, to readjust that uh, later on, should we find that things are necessary. We've already done that this year with 60 million pounds worth of changes due to coronavirus. Uh, but thank you for your comments, Councillor Jenkins. Uh, Steve, I'm perfectly aware we have a hard stop in February. As I stated earlier, what I'm trying to do is to enable our officers to do a better job for us in getting us to that point and relieving them of the unnecessary burden from excessive detail and operating possibly with out-of-date assumptions. But we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Councillor Jenkins. Councillor Netzinger. Thank you. Um, I wanted to come back to the point that you've just um, brought us to, Councillor Camp, which is which is the um, the necessity of trying to set a budget in order to um, uh, meet that crunch date, which is in act actually in early February or late January, which is coming extremely soon. Um, I think it is. Um, it, it's very clear that there are a whole bunch of uncertainties which are forced upon us by the pandemic. Um, it, I, I wouldn't expect anybody to be able to predict clearly what's going to happen in terms of the pandemic between now and the end of January. But I do feel incredibly frustrated by the fact that there are so many additional uncertainties which are being um, forced upon us by the failure of government to give us any clarity on um, the issues the, the, the support that they are going to be able to give us. Um, now, some of those are understandable. Um, it is understandable that the government is not necessarily able to um, tell us quite how much COVID support that they will give us at the moment. Others of those are utterly indefensible. Um, and one of those, so there are a, a, a few things. The first is, is um, that we're in a position uh, two months before we have to set a budget effectively. I mean, we, we're obviously starting our budget process now and we don't know at all. We have no clue um, at what level we are going to be able to set council tax. Um, you have just said that, um, and, and Chris has also supported this, that the current level is 2%. We have no idea whether we're going to be able to raise that. We know that 15% is what we would need to be able to set it in order to balance our budget purely on that basis. And you are absolutely right, Councillor Count, that is an utterly unacceptable level. Um, I, I wouldn't want any of us to be contemplating asking the residents of Cambridgeshire for that level of council tax increase. The fact that we have no idea where in between those two, that 2% 2 and 15%, it is going to be acceptable for this council to set its council tax at this stage of the process is deeply, deeply disappointing and deeply unhelpful for our budget setting process. Um, and, and I just uh, uh, I know that you're in conversations with government. I hope very much that you will be putting pressure on them to let us know um, as soon as possible what the council tax um, situation is going to be so that councils can make their decisions on the basis of information that they have. And that one surely is not something that it is beyond the government to let us know as soon as possible, because it makes an enormous difference to the whole of this debate. And it is slightly pointless for us having much of this debate until we have that information. Um, we were intent, we were promised a budget in October and it was cancelled. I understand why it was cancelled, but we must have more information from government about what is going to be available to local government as soon as possible. Um, there are two other enormous issues which the government have been promising us information on for years um, and we still don't have it. One of those is the adult social care settlement. Um, where we have been promised a white paper for years and years and nothing has come out. Um, and, and as far as, I mean, I, ha I can see no excuse for that um, constant delay and for still having absolutely no information about what the government's long-term plan for the, for the funding of adult social care is. And it is clearly absolutely critical to our budget setting process. And the other of those, which um, is uh, also going to have an enormous impact on our um, 
budget for next year is Brexit. And again, we were promised a, um, a, a, an oven ready deal. This time last year, we were promised an oven ready deal. And we still do not know whether there will be a deal at all in at the end of December. That is two months away for so many businesses in this area who are already struggling with the enormous uncertainty of um, COVID to be also struggling with having no idea what their relationship with some of their key trading partners is going to be um, is just it's just impossible for local businesses um, and um, I, I hope very much that that point is being made um, by by this council because there are so many businesses in this area that depend on trade with Europe. Um, the other point I wanted to make was I wanted to pick up on something that Chris said in his initial um, introduction, which was um, that that they have started conversations with um, MHCLG, and I'm very glad that that is happening to make clear that the um, critical situation that this council's budget is in. Um, Chris said that um, it had been ma made very clear in return that councils will only get um, uh, support from MHCLDG if they do everything that is within their gift to mitigate the financial challenges. Now, my, my reading of that sentence was that if we do not put our council tax up to the maximum amount, we cannot expect any additional support from government. Um, which brings me back to the key point that we need to know what that amount is in order to be able to do this budget process sensibly. And we need to know it really, really soon. Um, so if he could clarify whether that is also his understanding of what that sentence meant, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, so thank, thank you, Councillor Netzinger. Um, undoubtedly, I'm not surprised that Brexit has been introduced into the GPC conversation once again, although I do share some of the sentiments that it'd be useful to have some certainty on that. But it is a negotiation. There's two parties involved, uh, and we do hope that the other party, Europe, will see some sense and allow some flexibility, which is holding matters up at the moment. Um, I do join with you in my concerns that the adult social care paper still hasn't been uh, delivered. And I would welcome that uh, being moved forward. I can only assume that government has been distracted by other things such as the coronavirus epidemic, but there's only so long that you can wait for certain things and it is overdue. As is, and I will make this point very clearly, as is the fairer funding review. Cambridgeshire is hard done by by the allocations at the moment, and we are in partly in this difficult position because we do not get our fair slice of the cake in Cambridgeshire. We have been promised a fairer funding review for a number of years, and at every opportunity, I and your officers make representations to the government that this should not continue, that Cambridgeshire, that the fair funding review should be fought, brought forward. <clears throat> and should be completed. And in the absence of that, significant one-off funding should assist those councils that are at the lower end of the scale and being, as I would put it, hard done by. And the fairer funding review for me goes much more than about council finances. I believe that the fairer funding, we still do not have the right formulas for the national health, for education, or for the county or district councils in Cambridgeshire. Cambridgeshire is let down because of archaic formulas. I know that much busy at the moment between Brexit and the pandemic, but it is time that Cambridgeshire got its fair slice of the cake. Um, in terms of the council tax uh, increase and, and the amount of pressure and, and decision making you're putting on how we can manage by knowing what council tax increase we can implement. It's the reverse for me. It's what can we do and still deliver good outcomes for our residents between efficiencies, transformations, looking for those little, little pockets of reserves that we don't need on a temporary basis to get through this and resort to taxing the local people as a last thing, not the other way around. Taxation is there for when you can't deliver your outcomes any other way, not the go-to place the automatic default position, how much can I count, uh, tax my residents in order to move forward with spending plans to match that. So we, we're coming at this from two very different points of views. Uh, I do think that the government's um, comments about doing everything you can is on an individual basis. That, so they will look at us, they will look at our options and they will examine them thoroughly uh, and the way that we're moving forward with them. That is why perhaps it's difficult for them to 
give an answer on the council tax because every council in the country is in a very different place and they're going to have to come up with decisions based in, on the national interest and not just on our council's interest. They've got a lot of information coming in, but I, I would welcome an early decision on many factors as early as possible so we know what we're working in. But as I said earlier to Councillor Kindersley, I will not default to the maximum permitted um, as a first port of call. That is where you go to after you've exhausted your other resources uh, in a reasonable fashion. Uh, if I may, I shall move on to Councillor Dupre. I'd like to come back on one point, yes, Councillor, which, is, which was your implication that, that any of us would like to go to council tax as the first point of call. I absolutely challenge that at a time when so many families are struggling at, um, at unprecedented levels to try and meet their bills. None of us wish to raise council tax any more than is absolutely necessary. But we also have to recognize that there are many, many families who are on very low incomes who depend on our services and, and very vulnerable people who depend on our services. And if we always choose to cut those services first, we are cutting the services to the most vulnerable. And I think it's very important to make that point. Thank you. So, so I'm going to move, move on, but I will just say that the outcomes for our residents in Cambridgeshire are high from a low finance base, right? So it's not a matter of catering services, it's a matter of running an efficient council. But I will leave anybody who has watched the debate today come to their own opinion as to where the desire to impose council taxes are rather than the statement you've just made. I think this uh, meeting has spoken for itself. Councillor Dupre. Um, there are three things I want to pick up. The first one, uh, and, and they have been to some extent mentioned already in, in, in the debate that we've had so far. The first one is about the scenarios. Um, and we're told that we may, and I think this is, I, I share the view of one or two people who said that this may be somewhat optimistic, that we are somewhere around worse than scenario A, but not less than scenario B. Well, it's very difficult to judge from this paper because scenario A is spelled out to some extent with five bullet points describing the assumptions underlying it. Scenarios B and C are not. And this is the second time that we've had a paper covering uh, scenarios A, B and C. And when I reported back on this to my parish councils, one of the first questions from one of my parish councils was, well, we know what scenario A is because it's described. What are the um, assumptions underlying scenarios B and C so that it is absolutely clear and transparent uh, whether we are at one stage or another? And I would therefore be grateful if the officers could spell out, not now, but uh, either by circulation to this committee or in some other way, the assumptions underlying scenarios B and C, so that it is clearer as the situation with COVID develops, how far along that scale we are moving and therefore what the financial uh, effects on this council are likely to be. That's my first point, that without that information, it is very hard to judge where we are on this. The second point that I wanted to make was about Brexit, and I was somewhat astonished that Brexit had not been mentioned in this report at all, when it is crystal clear that the no deal that we are rushing towards at some speed now, having run out of time, is going to have a profound effect on the economy of Cambridgeshire and therefore on the finances of this council, and it has not been mentioned. I think it is now, uh, to all intents and purposes, completely clear that there is going to be either no deal or such tinkering as the margin, at the margins as to mean that we are effectively in no deal. We have left the European Union. We do not have agreement on fundamental things at the moment. And we have come, the, the government needs to come to a realisation that there is only so far that leaping around, waving a union jack and shouting, we are British, we deserve all the exceptions, we, we want all of the benefits of being a member of the European Union with none of the responsibilities and following none of the rules, will get us. It won't get us very far. It hasn't got us very far up till now as a negotiating strategy. And that isn't going to change because the EU is fundamentally 
a rules-based organization of 27 countries uh, and it's very clear that it operates by agreement and by following the rules and gaining the benefits of that that's a, that's a as crime. being the fundamental way it that's operates. I'm sorry, I, I, I haven't you finished speaking yet. The impact on Gentry and GPC, the direct impacts on this paper, please. I appreciate how passionate you are about the, the Brexit and staying in Europe and getting a good deal. But actually, can we stick to much more of the subject of what we're dealing with, please? Chairman, I'm trying my best to stick to the subject, bearing in mind the enormous amount that's already been said and needs to be counted on this. Um, with, with great respect, You've taken the opportunity to respond at length to everybody who's spoken. Uh, I have one more point to make, which is about council tax. And the point about council tax is that thus far, all of these sums uh, that we're seeing today are based on the assumption of a zero council tax increase other than the 2% for adult social care that we are assuming is going to be allowed. Um, if that is your assumption, that we can cover costs, uh, additional cost savings requirements of between 40 and over 80 million pounds without increasing the council tax at all, then I think the only assumption that we can draw from that is that many, many people, as uh, Councillor Nefzinger has said, who have little income and rely on our services are going to find those services cut from under them or they are going to find themselves having to pay very much increased costs to access those services. Given the scale of the financial mountain we have to climb, other than the government coming in like the deus ex machina, like the knight on the white horse saying, here you are, here's 80 million, and I don't think that's going to happen, and I don't think you do either, then it seems to me that relying on the, the people who depend on our services most to make up that shortfall in extra charges or reduction of service is a terrible thing to do, and you are absolutely right that this debate today has drawn some very clear lines between where the two groups that stand on this. Uh, so thank you, Councillor Dupre. Um, just on the first comment, the ABC scenarios. So um, I agree with you, it'd be useful to have the um, sort of scenario bullet points, what B means, what C means, so we can all make our own judgments where we are on, on that scale. In terms of doing the workings out for each scenario, uh, we know that scenario is A is in front of us with a £32 million deficit at the point in time that the papers was, were written. And we know that scenario C is an £80 million deficit from the papers in front of you. All right? And anywhere on that spectrum in between is, is you know, the ABC scenario. But it would be useful to understand what they mean. But um, I agree with you. If there is £80 million pounds, uh, deficit coming along, I do not expect government to come along with £80 million pounds and rescue us 100%. Um, I, I'd like it, but I don't think it's going to happen. But I would expect there to be a, a good deal of finance because if we are hit by 80 million pounds and you multiply that out nationally, too many councils would be in section 114 notices. It's impossible to envisage that sort of uh, impact without additional support. I think the scenario uh, in front of us, A, whilst it may not be the best um, or the most accurate up-to-date scenario planning uh, scene, does give us an indication of, of what we think will happen there. But as you go up, you've got to expect that there will be some government freedoms or government finance to deal with matters if you start getting solidly into the Bs or the Cs. But as I said earlier on in the, in the, in the debate, I think we need to just understand the information. And from the debate we've had today, there's a lot of people really on top of these figures. I can see that you're all getting a really good grasp about our role in this in putting a budget forward for next year. And we will get more information as we go along, which will be quite useful. Um, I, won't, I won't continue talking about Brexit. Obviously, um, the Liberal Democrats wanted to highlight today and at every opportunity. Um, I am very keen on the impacts in, in, our, in our local area. Um, and I think that the, um, as I said earlier, when I said to, spoke to Councillor Netzinger, with regards to council tax and positions, 
Um, I do think that the um, general public will be able to view this debate today and see which party is leading the charge for increased uh, council tax first, rather than looking at other options second. Councillor Josh Schumann. Thank you, Steve, and uh, probably quite a, um, a segue into my comment um, to say that there seems to be uh, two themes um, that have run uh, into the, the comments that have been made around our budget setting from a lot of the Liberal Democrat colleagues uh, today. One is a lack of consistency in, in actually what they're uh, likely to be calling for already, and two is the focus on council tax, which you've alluded to. Uh, we started with the comment of we should be increasing council tax by the highest amount possible, um, and that was backtracked quite quickly. Um, uh, and uh, um, that, that was just wrong, Josh. I'm sorry. Sorry, I, I didn't realise there was a, an official point of order raised there, but that was absolutely the comment was made, and as Steve alluded to earlier, um, that can be watched back on the on the recording. Um, and then we had uh, Liberal Democrat colleagues go on to say nothing but council tax. Um, I would urge those same people, particularly the leader of the uh, Liberal Democrats at Cambridgeshire and her colleagues, to come forward with suggestions about how uh, savings may be achieved, about how this council can be run efficient, efficiently, rather than just sit there and suggest that council tax is the panacea to all of our problems. Um, and the suggestion that council tax increases is the way to solve our problems uh, has not been uh, fully recognised the challenges that presents to our communities in a time when people are losing their jobs, are struggling to pay their bills, are fearful for their security of their home, and suddenly the answer uh, from the Liberal Democrats is, you know what, that what these people really need is an increase in council tax at any level possible. I think it's quite frankly disgusting. And uh, also the Sorry, I'm just going to have to chip in, Josh. Lucy, I didn't interrupt you once. Now, please have the common courtesy not to interrupt me. It's, uh, it's absolutely uh, uh, the, the right form that we go through the chair. If you want to speak, then do it the way that I have. The suggestion from the Liberal Democrat colleagues that there is some kind of exclusive divide between those that use our services and those that pay council tax is also disgusting. Those things are not mutually exclusive. We have people that pay council tax that still rely on our services. And those people are the very ones that will be hit hardest by the increases which we time and time again hear the Liberal Democrats calling for, because those people are the ones that have that very fine balance between needing support and being self-sufficient. And I'm hopeful, uh, Steve, I know our challenge is, is great and I know our challenge is vast, but we've had challenges before and we've met them. And we're gonna do our damnedest to make sure we do the same, but not making bold statements about increasing council tax at this time, but by instead looking at every opportunity we have to be the most efficient council while still delivering really high quality services. As we found out before from having independent reviews, we have managed to do year on year. So thanks Steve, I'd apologies for coming in with nothing but comments uh, and certainly no questions uh, on the report. I think we have to note the report, which is very frustrated by some of the comments that seem to be completely focused around council tax from the Liberal Democrat colleagues. You're on mute. Sir. Thank you, Councillor Schumann. Councillor uh, Machini. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, it's been an interesting debate so far. Um, it's kind of gone on a little bit. Um, at this particular point in time, I think it's fair to say that, you know, um, I mean, we can't not talk about council tax because at the moment we're trying to deal with uncertainty and we're trying to describe, you know, what are the things at our disposal that we can use to plug what looks like it could potentially be quite a big hole and council tax has to be part of the discussion I mean it's absolutely it's absolutely fundamental that it should be part of the discussion and you know the conservative group has has raised council tax in the past uh, by what it considered necessary and we will presumably have to consider the opportunity that that will need to be done again um, I will um, mention council tax again in a question that I have later first of all I was going to make a comment which has largely been made before, but can I please add my voice to the absolute frustration that is, um, and I've said this in committee, other committees before, about the national funding formula, because that is absolutely fundamental. I know everybody says, you know, we're frustrated about this, and I can understand that, but, you know, there are a number of things, a number of white papers that would make our services run better, and these have been put 
on the back burner because of the pandemic. But this is crucial pandemic work. I mean, councils fold financially because you don't have the funding right. And we're going to have, I mean, I don't know about us. I hope it's not going to be us. But there are going to be local authorities at risk of folding because of the pandemic. And this is the kind of work that saves councils. So I would really, really like the funding formula work to be prioritized. I know it's not within our gift to make that happen, but it absolutely, the point absolutely has to be made because it's incredibly frustrating that it's being treated just like any white paper that is going to be delayed. Um, so that was going to be my comment. Um, in terms of council tax, so, um, I mean, obviously, as I said, at this point, all you want to know is your options. So you want your numbers in front of you and, you know, so that you can choose when the point comes, which is not yet, obviously, but when the point comes, you can choose the best thing to do. Um, in reference to that, I have one question. The first question I have asked actually before, I'm going to ask it again slightly more specifically. Um, have we had a discussion with our five constituent districts about the projections for council tax collection and whether or not it is significantly affected by the pandemic because there are significant numbers of people in the county right now that were perfectly able to afford their council tax last year but won't be able to afford it this year so if we are going to decide on a not point not not one percent increase we need to know if that is going to bring the money that we think or if it's going to bring less. I mean, that is absolutely important because I know from my discussions with the city council that they have halted collection and they have been promised by government that the plug will be plugged, um, the hole will be plugged, whatever you say. I mean, these things are very important because if you're going to consider whether or not you're going to take in X millions, I mean, you have to know the likelihood that 100% of those millions are going to come in. So that was my first point. My second point about council tax is that on... Oh, Sorry, I had some problems with my internet and my papers have been all taken back to page one. <laughs> so now I can't remember where I was. Um, but basically, there's somewhere in the paper where it says um, that a 1.99% increase in council tax will take in 6 million. Now, is it true that if the current guidance doesn't change, and if we were to have the exact same guidance for council taxes last year, that you would be allowed without a referendum to raise 2.99%. Um, I thought that was true. Um, so can somebody please confirm? And that's that regarding council tax. And my final question was going to be, and you'll have to bear with me now because I'm going to have to find this page that I had on before. This, was, this is to do with the use of reserves and... In section, uh, whereabouts are we? Um, in section 3.4, where it describes the number of financing options available to the council to contribute towards closing the gap for 21-22, it has a bullet point about funds reallocated on a one-off basis from reserves. And then it has a further bullet point later on about um, a last resort to utilize any reserves on provision or provisions held on its balance sheet that are not a contractual commitment. Please, could somebody explain the difference to me? And I'm assuming that we're going to get a bit more, um, obviously, a bit more detail on these things as the situation progresses. But I think we're going to have to start getting into the point, I mean, October's almost at an end. Um, you know, we're going to get to the point quite soon at that, you know, we're going to need the detail as granular as possible. So I think figures and different scenarios of how much res reserve is where and how much reserve is used for what and what is easier to use and what is more difficult to use and all of these kinds of things, we're going to need to have a look at them. Because um, once again, as is the case for council tax, I doubt that we'll be able to just exclude having to use reserves reserves in the same way that we are unable to exclude having to raise council tax. So those are my questions and thank you very much for bearing with me. Uh, thank you, Councillor Machini, and thank you for those uh, intelligent uh, questions. Um, because the um, I, I know the answers on the reserves, but Chris is so much better and paid and paid to explain things. I'm going to bring Chris in to explain the uh, reserves and the question on the 2.9%, 99%. Chris. 
Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'll, I'll try and take uh, Councillor uh, Machini's uh, questions in the order that they were raised. Um, the first one was actually about uh, working with colleagues in our districts and uh, the billing authorities, because obviously we aren't a collecting authority, so therefore um, the function of collection of accounts tax uh, sits with our district and city colleagues. Uh, we Yes, we are working with them on, on a regular basis. We uh, in, in the projections that you've got in front of you today in terms of the uh, the, the modelling um, that Tom and his team have, have uh, produced uh, includes uh, the, the, what was the, at that point the latest projections around uh, collection fund deficits, both uh, council tax and business rates. Uh, we have assumed, um, based on the flexibilities that the government announced uh, earlier this year, uh, that those deficits will be defrayed over three years uh, rather than the, um, the current or the previous regulations uh, which required those to be written back or written off uh, in in the year in question. Um, so uh, the, the the whichever model you take has has got an assumption uh, over council tax and and business rates uh, income, um, but we will be updating that as the the forecast of our uh, uh, collection authority uh, colleagues uh, is updated with uh, um, uh, the latest uh, information they've got available because clearly that. That was based on uh, on collection levels uh, back in June, uh, and obviously they've, they've got uh, a few more year, a few more months experience. So those numbers will be updated as, as we go through the, the business plan process. But, but please rest assured, we are working with them. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the council tax limitation regulations, they are actually set every year. Um, so I, I can't actually tell you what the council tax limitation regulations are going to be for next year. They have um, more often than not been 1.99%, um, but as Councillor Machini highlighted, uh, there was one year where they actually increased that by a further 1% to 2.99%. Um, if that was the case, obviously that, that would be an additional three million pounds over and above what we've got in our, in our base uh, assumptions. Uh, just to remind um, members that, that the base assumptions were uh, a 2% adult social care precept uh, and a 0% council tax in increase. Um, in terms of the overall recipients, that makes no difference whether it's uh, adult social care or, or council tax. It's just um, the disaggregation of it from our budgeting purposes. Um, but their adult social care precept, it, technically um, the uh, end period was 31st of March, 2021. So we don't know if that will, that will exist for 21, 22. Um, um, but we will obviously put pressure on the government to come up with whatever the, the regulations are going to be around council tax uh, uh, as, as much as we can. Uh, and in terms of reserves, um, uh, in very simple terms, um, there are uh, unearmarked reserves and earmarked reserves, and the unearmarked ones are the ones we can use for anything we wish. Uh, and we, there are two core reserves that we hold uh, in, in that category. Uh, the general reserve, which we hold, uh, as, as the chairman mentioned earlier on, at 3% of expenditure, which is for uh, funding any, any unforeseen circumstances uh, in the years, which, which may arise as a council MTF, a medium term financial strategy uh, policy. Uh, if we draw on that reserve in the year, which we have done over the last few years, we re replenish it as part of the, the, the next budget process. Uh, so that places additional uh, pressure on, on the following year's budget, but so that so we can hold it at 3% of our operational expenditure. And that has served us well uh, over a, a number of years. Uh, we also have uh, the transformation uh, fund. So the general reserve sits at about 17 million pounds just for information purposes. Um, if you use that, of course, then you are uh, leaving yourself vulnerable in year uh, for any fluctuations that you can't uh, fund within the base revenue budget. Uh, the other general usable uh, reserve uh, is the transformation fund. So although that has been earmarked for transformation purposes, it's not earmarked for any specific purpose. And therefore that is usable, but clearly you can only spend it once if you use it for uh, propping up um, or supporting uh, base budgets uh, next year, then uh, you don't have that usable for either investment in transformation activity uh, or um, to be able to use it again in the future year. Uh, that currently stands at uh, just around 20 million pounds. Um, then, so they're, they're the uh, unearmarked uh, reserves, which you can use for any purpose the council wishes. Then the earmarked reserves are sums that the council have set aside for specific activities. And generally they, and, and that, that includes provisions that they're unearmarked, and, uh, sorry, earmarked and, and provisions are effectively the same thing. Uh, so we, we've set aside money from revenue uh, onto the balance sheet for a specific purpose. 
and that that can be anything. So you know, we we hold an insurance uh, reserve, for instance, uh, because we self-insure. So um, we, we self-insure quite a lot of our, our risks, uh, and therefore we draw on that and then replenish it. Um, you know, bad debt provision, uh, and so it goes on. I mean, there, there are a whole raft of different uh, provisions and uh, earmark reserves that are held on the balance sheet, uh, which are quite a significant amount of money. Uh, but if you utilise those, obviously you don't have the reserve available uh, for should that um, the reason that it's been set aside uh, comes to fruition uh, to fund that. Uh, so therefore you're increasing uh, your risk uh, of uh, not being able to meet liabilities as, as they arise in any particular year. Uh, hopefully that answers Council Machine's questions, Chen. Uh, thank you. So, sorry, can I say something really briefly in response to that? Thank you sure. so very, very much. That was exactly what I was looking for. I was just going to plead, if possible, if we can have a little appendix or something like that, a little summary of what you just explained with like the figures as they are sort of now happy, happy next, to to it. That, <laughs> next to it because obviously you know that's not so much for us to you know this is what we're doing but it's for us to understand this is the kind of thing we're going to have to do at some point and it would really help me as somebody who repeats very frequently that my finance is not very good uh, it would really help me understand these are the different baskets from which different size handfuls of things are going to be, be to be taken at some point so thank you so much I think that they're uh, included as, as an appendix, so whether it's published today or not, as, as part of the IRP report. But it'd be useful, really, to um, to perhaps go through uh, specifically the um, uh, the earmarked reserves and actually give greater definition to the impact of, of utilising them, um, so that we could all really understand that. Yes, I am correct. It's on page um, uh, thirty of one one four, the reserves and positions. Uh, and goes on to 31. It'd be useful to really understand those in terms of the impacts should we choose to use any of those uh, and what they would mean. Um, and I think for, for a future paper, Chris, it may also be useful to split down the, um, the, 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 the impacts on next year, how many of those are one-off funding, uh, require fun one-off funding solutions, and how many have an ongoing revenue impact, should anyone uh, think about using reserve against any of them, okay? We'll do, we'll do, Chairman. Okay. Uh, Councillor Lucy Netzinger. Thank you. Um, I will be very brief because I do feel we've spent long enough on this, but I just cannot allow um, Councillor Schumann's comments to go unchallenged. Um, his implication that we would want to be putting up council tax on anybody this year is entirely unfair and untrue. Um, if he thinks we are unaware of the enormous pressures that there are on families um, this year, that would be completely unrealistic. Um, I cannot tell you how many of my close friends have suffered enormously this year through lack of income. The impact on self-employed people has been extraordinary. I cannot tell you how many people there are out there who are um, suffering incredible financial pressure um, and, and that financial pressure, that, that they are staring into a, a financial abyss um, and the ending of the furlough scheme and the offer of only two thirds um, support to those whose jobs are not still um, continuing is an, a, just terrifying for so many families. We are painfully aware of this, Josh. Um, and, I, and I just, we, we've heard so much misrepresentation from national government. I do not want to have that kind of misrepresentation starting at this council. So I just wanted to make that very clear and I will now stop. Thank you. Uh Councillor Kindersley, and then I'll sum up. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Well, I, I, I was really going to apologise because when I asked my three questions as opposing to make um, three statements, I had no idea that I was lighting such a touch paper that we would listen to Councillor Schumann refer to um, a political position as disgusting. I think, um, you know, I would ask him to consider the language he uses. Disgusting is used, I think, more aptly when you see people fossicking around when they're supposed to be in lockdown, when you see uh, terrible things happening, and when you see um, uh, people, you know, walking by and not helping. It's perfectly acceptable to have different political views, and I think what makes this council a better place is if we treat our different political views with respect and with interest and to ask questions and to make statements if necessary, but we don't need to use language like disgusting. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kinsley. I'm going to draw this to a close now. Uh, I, I think that 
any reactions from Councillor Schumann or myself was based on what we heard in the earlier part of this debate. And you yourself, Councillor Kindersley, are just have just apologised for the way it seems to have come across. And it came across to me as a, a palpable desire on behalf of Liberal Democrats to go for um, maximum... Steve, you're repeating the same misinformation. That is not true. Please, please don't interrupt, Councillor Netzinger. It came across to me and it came across to Councillor Schumann as a palpable desire to put up council tax as a first port of call. Your later clarifications have been that's not the case. And I will state what I said earlier. I will leave it to the public who can view this debate on recording as to whether they believe those clarifications came about because you were misunderstood and I brought, brought attention to that or because you misstated your positions. That's up to the public to decide. I've got no more to say on this subject. I'm going to go to the um, uh, vote now on, on this paper. Uh, there are three recommendations. We've had a lot of questions on this. Um, most of the, the recommendations are note the overview, note the impact, and request that officers undertake the necessary actions to ensure that government is clear on the negative impact on our service delivery if additional support is not forthcoming. Um, I'm not sure that I've heard anybody speak against the recommendations. We've, we've asked for a lot of clarifications, etc. So I'm just going to ask uh, whether we're OK to take this as a unanimous position to approve the recommendations. And if not, if I see any raised hands, then, of course, I will go to a vote on the subject. So are there any raised hands? I can see that. Oh, I do have a raised hand. Uh, Eliza, would you like I, I to... I do apologise. No, I don't want to express dissent. I just had a question about the recommendations. Okay. Um, I, obviously, I don't wish to suggest that that needs to be the case. However, we have heard a specific uh, mention today about asking a specific question of government about how the one billion resources will be formulated. Is it worth adding that as something that we will ask the government into the recommendations or is it so too late now? Look, well, I, I, I'll take that as an action. It's something that we're doing. Absolutely. We can put it down as an action. You'll see that we'll, we'll, we'll ask them. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Uh, with that in mind, uh, can I just check if anybody else, else wants us to actually vote on the recommendations? If not, I will take that as a unanimous approval. I'm seeing no hands indicated, so I'm going to take that as you know, unanimous in favour of the recommendations. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on now to agenda item number six, the service committee review of the draft 2021-22 capital programme. Can I invite the Chief Finance Officer, Chris Mallion, to introduce the report, please? Chairman, uh, I'm the Head of Finance, Chairman. Sorry, sorry uh, please accept my apologies. I, I, I realise we haven't had a comfort break since the start of this. I plan to have it after the... Um, after the last uh, meeting, but uh, last um, after the last item, but it did carry on quite a long while. Would uh, everybody like a ten-minute comfort break? There's a few th thumbs up. So please, if we can return at twenty-five past twelve, please. Thank you.
Chairman, just so you're, you're aware, um, Tom's taking the next item. Okay, thank you. Yeah, he'd, he'd let me know, so. Can I just check with Monica? I take it, does, did streaming continue? Uh, does streaming continue throughout or does it, do I ask for it to restart? Steve, it's still saying live on YouTube at the moment. Um, and the, you're right, the streaming has continued. Oh, I see. So yeah, it's yeah, still being streamed, yeah. Okay, well, it's 25 past on my uh, time uh, indicated now. Um, so I'm going to move ahead and restart the meeting. Uh, can I ask Tom Kelly to introduce the report, uh, agenda item number six, the service committee review of the draft 2021 to 22 capital programme. Uh, thank you, Chairman. We're at page uh, 73 of the, uh, of the bundle. This report forms part of the process set out in the capital strategy to update, review and refine uh, capital planning over the extended um, planning period. Um, we confirm in the report that the full strategy review and prioritisation across committees will come uh, back to GPC in the next couple of months. At 4.1 and 4.2, we do provide an overview of uh, capital budgets over the coming years on a service by service basis, and also show the funding sources across grants, contributions, and borrowing, and there are further details for this committee on those borrowing sources in the appendix at page 83. Uh, the committee will know that where there is uh, borrowing as part of our capital plans as a twofold impact, uh, both interest payments, uh, as well as repayment of the uh, principal uh, otherwise known as the minimum, minimum revenue provision. At 5.4, we then um, focus, and, and all of the reports that have gone to individual committees this time, focus just on the, the uh, capital implications for each committee. And for GPC, that's predominantly in the areas of technology. Uh, there are three major updates uh, around IT strategy and the data center relocation, where the impacts of uh, COVID or other timing issues have um, uh, moved uh, some of those commitments between financial years. And then there's also the investment in Connecting Cambridgeshire, uh, a budget that we are reworking to get that more closely aligned to the contractual arrangement we have there with a uh, supplier uh, that provides payback at different times throughout that contract. Um, I think that's all I really need to say at this point in the introduction. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, comprehensive report. Uh, can I invite members of the committee to ask questions or comments should they so desire? I'm seeing no blue hands. It's a very straightforward report and one we're used to. I do have a blue hand now. Uh, Eliza, Sorry, it's just a very, um, I was going to say if anybody had any more specific question than mine, but I figured I might just as well ask it. It was a very good report and it, it felt, I mean, I'm going to say, I'm going to be very honest, it felt too straightforward considering how difficult I usually find these things. Um, is the perfect alignment between what you expect to spend and what you expect to raise to fund it um, sort of I say manufactured, I don't mean badly, but like, is it intentional and designed to be that way? Or is there any potential for that to change? Chairman, for you, I think there's, um, there's two points to mention in response to that, I suppose, uh, from the first thing is from the, the capital side, the services that this committee directly oversees is, is relatively limited. So it's, it's just the service committee aspect rather than the complete overview. So that to some extent limits the scope. Um, in this meeting, you will see the full overview in, in meetings to come. Uh, and then as it the, the approach we're seeing really is that prudential borrowing makes up the difference between all of the extended, external funding sources such as grants and contributions and then that remaining uh, balance is for the council to fund. So that's why you see an alignment because really um, prudential borrowing is used to kind of bridge that, bridge that gap. 
I think if I could add in as well, the, the simplicity, uh, like I say, is borne about by the fact that this is a sum of all the independent reports. So it's, it's, it's an additions table almost, uh, but the individual service committees have got their com much more complex, exactly identified capital projects identified in there. I, if that's helpful. Right. I'm not seeing any other hands, in which case uh, I've heard nobody spoke, speak against. Can I take it that we'll take this uh, uh, as unanimous for recommendations? If not, I'm looking for a blue hand and we shall go to a vote. Okay, I'm not uh, seeing any hands, in which case there seems to be a, a general uh, consensus. So we'll take the recommendations as carried. Thank you. Moving on, uh, agenda item number seven, the transformation bid micro enterprise rollout. Uh, can I invite the commissioner of the partnerships and programs, Graham Hodgson to introduce the report, please. Over to you, Graham. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the key points around this paper are that earlier this year, um, a review of the home care market was completed by commissioning and resulted in the development of a strategic vision to address uh, sustainability, market capacity and workforce in terms of recruitment, retention and diversity. Uh, the actions outlined in that vision will be incorporated within the wider resilience and recovery strategy of the council. One such action was to encourage and support the development of home care micro enterprises, often one or two or three individuals who earn their living from the enterprise. The micro enterprise model has been proven to work in a range of areas across the county, uh, sorry, across the country supported by a specialist social enterprise called Community Catalysts. This model and its impact is clearly evidenced in section five of the paper. The, uh, the purpose of increasing the number of micro enterprises providing care and support in the local market is uh, manifold. Firstly, it will grow and diversify the range of care and support options available in the local community, ranging from personal care to food shopping and delivery, cleaning, gardening and befriending services amongst others. Secondly, uh, to offer more choice and flexibility to those who require care and support at home. Thirdly, to enable more people to remain living well at home for longer. And finally, to attract more people into the care workforce and create new employment opportunities for local residents, particularly in underserved rural areas. The first stage of the project will be a diagnostic to identify the most suitable area in Cambridgeshire for the first micro enterprises. And after this initial rollout period of two years, uh, the council will have acquired the necessary first hand knowledge and experience to replicate the micro enterprise development catalysts in communities all over the county without support from uh, community catalysts themselves. This committee is therefore asked to approve the £160,000 transformation funding bid and secondly, to approve the direct award of the contract to Community Catalysts, who are the only social enterprise with a track record operating in this specific market. Thank you. Th thank you, Graham. Uh, any questions from members of the committee or comments? Uh, Councillor David Ambrose-Smith. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a comment, really. Uh, Graham has said most of what I was going to say. Uh, thank you, Graham. Uh, a very clear paper. Uh, it was well received by adults on the 8th of October, uh, and it was all agreed unanimously to take this up. What it, on top of what Graham has just mentioned, uh, the risk to the authority is, uh, is in the main, uh, uh, using the RAG system, uh, green. There's only the only problem we have, the negative, which is, amber, which is, uh, which is the COVID problem, which is, is all with us. But uh, other than that, Chair, that's uh, a very positive paper, and I say again, well received by the adults. Uh, committee uh, on the 8th. Thank you. Thank, thank you, David. Uh, Councillor Ian Bates. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'm very happy to support this. Um, my wife and I uh, do actually shop for people in the village. Um, and I think there are plenty of initiatives around in villages and in communities uh, that think about their communities. And we need to capitalise, I think, on the good work that uh, Steve Criswell has been doing uh, with Adrian Chapman as we go forward. Um, so I'm very supportive of what I call this approach. I did have a question, which is about, <laughs> in, I couldn't quite see the timing of when something might come back to see how it gets on, as they say. Uh, that may well go 
back to the adults committee but uh, I was looking for that but very much support the initiative as I see as I laid out on the paper Mr Chairman. Thank you Councillor Bates. Um, I, I do believe it will be the adults committee that will be doing the monitoring of this we're responsible for approving the finance but we do, it does go through the transformation scheme so I think the actual transformation bid goes through goes through us if you see what I mean. Uh, I'll probably ask, um, yeah, getting a nod from Graham there. Right, um, Councillor David Jenkins. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm sure this is an exceedingly good idea, um, but there's two mm. serious omissions in the paper. Um, one is the business plan has not been completed in terms of the payback of the project. Um, in paragraph 2.5 of the main paper, it does talk about £170,000 per year contribution from the business. Um, but I think we need a little bit more than that and to show how that £170,000 is going to be achieved and how it will, be, it will contribute to the payback. There is a, a table in one of the appendices and we should have it filled in. And I did refer to that £170,000 as being a contribution and that is the second um, major omission that I see here, in that it doesn't explain to me how this will actually work. Um, is it going to be a, a large number of peer-to-peer -peer transactions, or is there going to be some sort of an administrative network which will ensure that the micro-enterprises can be brought into contact with the people that they are serving? I suspect it will be the latter, in which case the cost of the latter needs to be in the economics. So those two omissions need to be fixed. And until they are, I cannot support this proposal. Uh, Graham, could you come back on either of those two points that Councillor Jenkins has raised, please? Yes, absolutely. Thank you uh, for the questions. Uh, and thank you, Chair. Um, the return on investment will come in the form of the savings and the cost avoidance uh, at the moment, a lot of people, especially in rural communities, Councillor, uh, are forced to, um, uh, uh, to to resort to carers coming in, agency carers coming in from further afield, and there are all sorts of travel costs associated with that. Many care agencies charge uh, a significantly higher rate per hour than would these smaller micro enterprises that exist in the in the. Uh, care receivers, if you like, community itself. So travel costs are expected to be largely eliminated. Um, the actual hourly rate charged by these smaller micro enterprises is much lower as well. Um, and at the moment, uh, many personal budgets and direct payments are being uh, used to cover very high costs of agency care fees. And we believe that uh, through the uh, supporting of the creation and development of these micro enterprises, there'll be a significantly lower cost to the council of provision of these statutory care services. Um, in terms of uh, completion of tables and so on, um, as was mentioned uh, in the paper, there will be an initial phase of uh, diagnostics, which community catalysts will bring to bear their experience with other counties and other local authorities, and they'll be able to um, support us in identifying very early on uh, where um, savings uh, will be uh, possible and how much. And of course, that depends on the locality which will be chosen for the initial rollout of the micro enterprises. So I would anticipate to answer one of the questions that was raised earlier as well about when we can begin to see some more information or KPIs, if you like, around the project. And the expectation is that after the first six months, we'll have uh, a very clear um, indication of uh, the locality that's been chosen and the initial work that's been done to develop micro enterprises. After the first year, we expect to have a, a considerable number of enterprises already up and running. And obviously, by the end of the, the full period of two years, um, we, there is a, a number mentioned in the paper about the uh, projected uh, number of micro enterprises that we would hope to see. And those and that's when the full saving and return on investment is expected to to reach uh, completion. But I thank the councillor, uh, David Jenkins, for your comments. And obviously, we'll incorporate those into the um, communication back to, to this committee and to adults committee on the progress of the project, if approved. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, um, can I ask you, David, go ahead. Yeah, I, look, um, I, I believe everything that Graham says, and this looks like a good project to me, but if we have identified savings, we should spell it out as to how they should be worked up. This is a business case, so let us make a business case. And as I said, there's also a, 
some sort of infrastructure or network which is supposed to support these micro enterprises. I think we need to identify how that will work and how much that is going to cost. These things come together for a complete system. If I could have your assurance, Chair, that we could get a, a complimentary paper with some detailed numbers, I'd be quite comfortable with that. So um, I was just going to ask either either Graham or Amanda. So the first the first point is these uh, 750 hours, 170,000 pounds. I think that's quite clearly defined in the paperwork as a reason to move to move ahead. It's the difference in cost between what we pay now and what these micro uh, uh, units would be expected to be charging for our statutory cases. The second one about filling out the business um, case will come after the site is identified in some further work. So my question would be to either Graham or Amanda, when would you expect that uh, paper to come back to us on a progress report? report? Would that be six months? I, I would suggest uh, six months would be an appropriate time for us to begin to feedback, certainly on the location that's been chosen for rollout of the initial microenterprises and hopefully to see some enterprises already formed uh, at that time. Okay, so on that basis, we've got the first point covered. The second point will come back to us in six months time, but they need permission today to go ahead in order to do to do that uh, at six months time. We will see if it's progressing well and to be continued or not. Now, the third point, I think uh, what Councillor Jenkins was really referring to was how intensive the um, County Council back office staff will be in the management of this and whether that's incorporated in the business case. And would that, that, that will be incorporated in the six month uh, update as well? Uh, yeah. Should I respond to that, uh, Councillor? Yes, please. So um, certainly on that point, um, the money that we're requesting for the transformation funding is actually to pay an external uh, organization, Community Catalyst. And through our experience of working with them over the two year period, uh, we will acquire uh, as commissioning staff and as operational teams on the ground, um, the expertise that they currently have, which we don't possess. So the idea is that we will learn through the process of working with them. Uh, for that reason, after the two-year period, there is no anticipation that there will be a, a, an a, a need to spend again on these consultants' fees because we'll already have that knowledge in-house. And uh, there will be very clear sort of step-by-step -step, um, uh, guidance on how to set up a care, a home care micro-enterprise, which could be delivered simply online on the County Council's website, for example. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of learning over the next two years, which uh, our teams will be able to then share with people who are interested in, uh, uh, in, in, in forming this kind of micro enterprise. So there is certainly not the anticipation that at the end of the two year period, the, the council would have to find another um, 160,000. I'm not suggesting we would have to, but I am suggesting that in order to enable all the necessary peer to peer transactions that are going to work here, the county council will put some possibly minimal level of um, central admin in to make it happen. That's not described in the paper and it's not accounted for in the economics. Um, just to respond then on that, um, we are talking about micro enterprises who uh, will not in any way be, if you like, um, monitored or, or audited by, by the council because they are private companies. And so once they're set up as private entities, it will be their uh, in their own business interests to ensure that they are growing and performing well. Um, and, and the council will merely assist in setting up new micro enterprises. Once the, once the micro enterprise is formed, um, that will feed into the, the supply of care services in the market as, as do the services of any other care agency. But I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, there's something in the mechanics here which I'm not understanding. Somebody has a need for care are we expecting that person then simply to go out and find their own micro enterprise to deliver it? Or do they call the county council who will then put, a, put that person in touch with the micro enterprise? Thank you for your question, councillor. Um, the way it works is that when a care, an eligible care need is identified, um, the council will, uh, social workers will identify the, the best uh, uh, source of, of that care as, as normal, as happens today with, with care agencies. Um, however, there are many self-funders out there who are not the council's responsibility, and they also report uh, huge difficulties in finding uh, appropriately costed care, especially locally in their own community. So those individuals uh, will obviously be able to draw from the care services provided by these new micro-enterprises, not to mention the fact that um, there will be 
job creation uh, as a result of the project as well. So we, we ex expect to see a lot of employment opportunities in the care sector. And once people have had that experience of being trained up and entering the care sector through these micro enterprises, um, they are then available, if you like, in the community to either work for other agencies in the future or to be employed as personal assistants by our citizens who receive direct payments, which is another very, um, uh, very flexible uh, way of, of individuals exercising choice over the care they receive. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Graham. Councillor Roger Hickman. Thank you, Chair. Um, this does seem like a very good idea, which I'll support, but my challenge, if I may, through you, Chair, as etiquette seems to have gone out the window in certain parts of this meeting, um, is about timing. Because it does seem that, from what Graham was saying, this has been rolled out after two years, which is the break-even point. But you also said that we'd identify savings a lot earlier. So can you just clarify when this could possibly be rolled out across the county? Thank you. Whenever a micro enterprise is set up, they will immediately start providing services. And our hope and expectation is that many micro enterprises will be formed within the first year of, of the project. Once that happens, there'll immediately be a saving in the sense that the, the the fees they're charging for their hourly services are considerably lower than those charged by larger um, uh, care agencies um, with further to travel. So there is and certainly an anticipated saving within the first year. I hope that answers your question. Um, through you, Chair, if I may. Um, yes. No, not really, because what I'm seeing is a very good idea which can be identified quite quickly as to whether it's working or not. In your introduction, you said about rolling it out after two years, and I say that that coincides with the break-even point. Whether that's coincidence or whether that's um, the way it's fashioned, I'm not still not sure. And the fact that we are doing stuff throughout the year, in the first year, and we can identify hopefully more savings than we think, I, I'm just asking. I suppose is this the worst-case scenario that's put before us, um, um, or are we actually anticipating uh, more savings coming forward? There's nothing wrong with this idea. I'm just trying to get a picture in my mind of how it actually works on the ground and how quick we can make it work or how quick we can identify it doesn't work. Um, well, I think the issue may be with the terminology because when we say a rollout, it's not a rollout of microenterprises after a two year period. It's, 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 it's before that. As soon as uh, the community catalysts are in place, the consultants who will be providing the support to individuals who wish to set up small uh, micro enterprises, they will be free to do so from, from day one. So um, rollout may be slightly misleading. It's not that we'll only have the micro enterprises after two years, we'll have them from a very early stage in the first, in the first year. Um, so the, the calculations around anticipated savings obviously take into account the full period of the, of the rollout project. So over the period of two years, the 170K um, is, is, is expected to be attained after two years, but the savings will continue uh, beyond just as they will begin well before that two year period. If, if I understood your question correctly, I hope I've answered it. I, I, I think you've asked, answered most of it. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, Amanda. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to remind everybody that we any program that's funded by the Transformation Fund comes into the quarterly Transformation Fund reporting to this committee. And when we do that cycle, we always ask questions about how is this going and should we accelerate it? Should we invest more to scale up at pace? Should we pull back from something that we haven't got the evidence yet? So every single transformation project we do, I, I think probably this is at the nub of your question, Councillor Hickford, is if we see something is successful quickly, then we come back to you and say, should we do more of it? Should we accelerate this in a different way? So we'll be bringing this through in the quarterly reporting as we do with all other transformation funded projects. Okay, thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, I'm seeing no more hands indicated. I did have uh, one member that indicated early on that they may vote against. Uh, I'm just going to ask if there's a blue hand go up, I'll go to the vote. If not, I will take it as unanimous. Chair, just, I'm not... Chair, I'll just quickly clarify. I was never going to vote against. I debated abstaining on the basis of what I've heard. I'm happy to support. Yeah, th good to hear that. Thank you, Councillor Jenkins. And good questions, I think, we from yourself and Councillor Hickford and comments from... 
Councillor Smith, uh, Ambrose Smith, that we managed to identify the nuts and bolts of this project. A very good presentation as well, Graham Hodgson, very well answered for the um, for the questions that came in. So uh, thank you for that. I'm going to take that as unanimous then, um, so we can take that as carried unanimously as I've seen no hands, and I shall move on to the next agenda item. Next agenda item is number eight, the General Purposes Committee Agenda Plan, Training Plan, and appointments outside bodies, groups, and panels. Uh, can I invite the Democratic Services Manager, Michelle Rowe, to introduce the report, please? Um, Chairman, I have no items to add to your next meeting other than to say that group leaders are looking at uh, the virtual meeting protocol. So some of the items that you would have um, not at the meeting may well come to the meeting. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, can I ask if uh, any questions, comments? Don't expect any. Uh, if I don't see any hands, I'm just going to take the recommendations as noted and approved. I'm not seeing any, in which case I wish to thank you all for the meeting today and attending. It's uh, been a good meeting and we've done a fair amount. Um, thank you all for attending. Bye. Thank you, Chairman.